All right, and I'm on YouTube too for anybody that's got a preference. Way worse quality, but just different options. Yeah, sorry if you can hear the computer fan. Try to move it away. All right, so I'm going to give you guys just a quick update on everything that's going on. Um, perfect, good. Yeah, it's really loud for me, so I guess <laughs> the audio is keeping it out a little bit. Um, yeah, so what we got going on here. So the 4 Series is good. It's back on the road. Everything's fine. The biggest issue I have is we just have, like, crazy amounts of construction and stuff going on. So I haven't been driving it that much just because I don't want to tear the car up. And I made that TikTok probably like two weeks ago or a week ago or something showing like literally just randomly they'll tear up all the pavement off of the road. And when you're driving, it's like driving over gravel. So it's pretty bad. So I haven't been driving it that much. And that means that I haven't gotten to log it very much. So we're still tuning it right now. I haven't completed the full E85 tune yet. Um, so hopefully that'll be done soon and I can get back to just enjoying the car without thinking about logging and all the other testing stuff that I got to do. The three series has not been touched. I've been trying to find time to work on it, but it, I've just been super busy trying to keep up with YouTube and all the other social media nonsense that I keep trying to create. So the three series right now is still on jack stands. Um, any videos or pictures or anything have you seen of like an engine taken apart or a car taken apart? That was the three series. I had a bunch of people ask me like what happened to the 440i. That's not the 440i. She's still in good shape. Nothing's wrong with it. Um, I do have a good idea of what's wrong with the car, but I am trying to film it and create content with it, not just work on it like I normally would. So that's what's making it take a little bit longer. So we're probably, long story short, we're probably gonna be pulling the head off and replacing the cylinder head or at least getting it rebuilt. Um, but yeah, time will tell. I'll hopefully be able to put out a video on that over the next couple weeks. Um, as far as all the social media, I appreciate all the support, everybody that's been following me everywhere they were giving me a lot of support, but I know like the B58 OC page is kind of struggling right now. Um, it's up to like 1500 followers, but it doesn't get a lot of engagement. And a lot of people say that they don't see the posts and stuff like that. And somebody told me it's because I made it like a professional page so I could get all the advanced features to be able to schedule posts and stuff. But that means that Instagram knows you're trying to make it bigger. So then they slow down your engagement and try to get you to pay for like sponsored posts or whatever which i'm not doing so if you guys do see the page enjoy it definitely like share all that good stuff i'm gonna try to keep it going but yeah i know it's it's just struggling and some people are kind of upset because i'm sharing their posts and they got 1500 followers but they're getting like 20 likes or something i can't really do anything about that sorry i'm not gonna pay for my post to get more reach so Social media will be social media. Instagram will be Instagram. We'll just keep working through it, and hopefully that page continues to grow. Um, what else? So I think, I mean, those are the major updates. The 4 Series is getting close to hitting the limits of the clutch as well, so that will probably be my next upgrade. I know a lot of people are asking me, like, what am I going to do next? Um, obviously, I have everything I need to max out my turbo kit. So once I get a clutch and probably an intake manifold, I'll be open to pushing it further. But right now, even on the full E85 tune, we're not going to push it harder than we did last year. I'm just going to be able to run full E85 and flex fuel. So for now, it's pretty much just as fast as it was before. Just going to be easier to run it and have more fun with it. So, yeah. Oh, and with the 3 Series, a lot of people are very confused or didn't understand what I meant by turning it into a track car and having fun with it. I am not 
doing like an NPR 12,000 kit and, you know, 12 port injectors and all of this stuff and trying to chase four second quarter miles. I'm trying to go around a road course. I'm trying to go around a track. So I know, I know I'm, I'm going to be soft for a little while. Just give me some time. I'll grow up one day, but for now, uh, I'm going to try to enjoy the turns. So that's what I'm planning on building it for. I actually plan on tracking it pretty much stock for a while. Um, and then probably upgrading tires, suspension, you know, and kind of going down that rabbit hole. So sorry to people that didn't understand that or thought that I was going to be doing something different. All right. So, yeah, um, I mean, we're really just here to hang out. I don't really have any major news or anything outside of that. I'll be uploading more videos this week, but um, just wanted to set up some time to hang out and see what's going on with everybody. So let's see. I'll check if anybody's asking any questions. What's up? What's up? Broken drive shaft. Uh, so we have the funniest video of a drive shaft breaking. I don't know if you guys have seen that on TikTok and Instagram. And <laughs> I'll share it on my story after this or something. But that guy had an announcer that was <laughs> like screaming at the audience how much of a fail his car was because he tried to launch it and then he kept rolling. And the announcer's yelling at him like you're literally leaving pieces of your car behind you on the track. It was pretty bad. So if you guys got that, definitely share it. That that video needs a lot more likes and views. But yeah, watch out for your drive show. Uh, does the Gen 2 produce more power than the Gen 1? Generally, no. I mean, the thing about a turbo car, unless there's like a significant improvement in design or efficiency, the turbo is going to be your limiting factor in how much power you make. It doesn't even matter too much, like, the engine that you're running it on because the turbo is going to flow as much air as it can flow. That's your power adder. So with the same turbo, the same fuel setup, it should basically make the same amount of power. The only thing with the TU engines, the low compression ones, definitely seem to make more power on the stock engine without needing like a rebuild. So that's why you see a lot of like the six port super guys going really fast with just like a transmission upgrade and stock engine. Those, those engines are really strong, but making power, it should be pretty much the same. The biggest downside with Gen 2 is you don't have a high pressure fuel pump upgrade. So you have to do port to get any kind of jam going and that kind of sucks. Why did my B58 try biting my finger? Any info on this? So that's something that actually happens really often with me as well. Usually it's like if you just tickle the drain plug a little bit, it doesn't really like that and it'll it'll bite you. So just try to do it while it's asleep so you don't get caught. Straight E85 means lower boost, correct? And what would be the benefit? So with all things being equal, like AFRs, same amount of boost and all of that, you're going to need a lot more fuel with full E85. So if you aren't upgrading your fuel system and you're already maxing it out on an ethanol mix and you're going to have to run less boost with the 85, it doesn't always mean significantly less power because a lot of times you can run more timing, but usually it does. And all the flex fuel maps for um, like boot mode, MHD and all of that, it does. You're going to have less power with full E85. The only reason they release those maps is to support the flex fuel tuning. So when you have your flex fuel tune enabled, you can just run full E85 and not have to worry about the mix screwing up your fuel pressure or anything like that, but it's not gonna make more power unless you upgrade your fuel system more. Let's see, what's the most cost efficient way to go big turbo without PI? Get a Dorch stage two, upgrade your turbo and you'll be in the 600s, easy, with ethanol. Let's see. Yeah, I appreciate the support, guys. Again, thanks a lot. Let me switch over to YouTube. We got a couple comments. What's a good staggered setup for three series? So the easiest one is what I used to run, 245 front, 275 rear. Um, you don't need like super aggressive offsets. It fits pretty well. 
Um, if you get 255, 285, I know a couple people that are running that as well. You might need a little bit of camber um, and like a perfect offset to really lock it in. Uh, that's what I actually wanted to run on the four series, but the car is too low up front. So I'm running 285 in the rear and 245 up front. You'll just kind of have to play with it depending on your setup. Um, but if you have like in the rear 40 to 45 offset and then the front 30 to 35 offset, you can fit either 245, 275 or 255, 285 pretty easy. Just depends on your goals. I like to have as much tire as possible. Uh, thoughts on ethanol sensors using a split flow design like PTF or put all the flow through the sensor. What horsepower do you think requires a split flow? So I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Um, the protein freaks one replaces or like jumps into the low pressure fuel pump feed line, unless I'm missing something. So it doesn't split the line. Um, yeah, maybe I'm not understanding or maybe I'm missing something about how the PTF one works. All of them work. The only difference with them is where you install it. If you install it in the engine bay or if you install it on the fuel pump. So it's kind of up to you. I like the one in the engine bay just because it's less wires and stuff. Uh, did I find out what's wrong on the 340? Yeah, uh, I'm going to share more info soon. I just have not been able to film working on it, which has prevented me from working on it. So I'll hopefully be able to upload that video in the next couple of weeks to show you guys what's going on. But long story short, it's either going to need a cylinder head or a rebuild of the existing cylinder head. Uh, I got a precision race work stage three and it failed on the dyno. <laughs> Stuff happens, man. I showed you guys my dyno experience last year. And I like blew out a manifold gasket. That was the first time I've ever had an issue on the dyno. So unfortunately that sucks, especially when you got to pay for it. Um, you know, my shot was good for me and they knew it wasn't my fault and I was coming right back. So they kind of honored their price and we just hopped on and did three more pulls the following Monday after I fixed it. So just do what you got to do, put the stock one back in and send it. Let's see. Is it possible to hit 600 horsepower with a TU pump and turbo system stage two? That will be pretty much the absolute limit of the TU pump. You'll need the perfect ethanol mix and the perfect tune. But um, yeah, it's possible. Let's see. What's something to watch out for maintenance when having downpipe and tune? I mean, the only problem that I have with maintenance when I had a downpipe and a tune was my urge to like change everything else. There, there's nothing special about that. Every time you get under your car, you're going to think like, wow, this is easy to access. Maybe I should replace this too. That's the biggest problem with maintenance on our cars. Everything is easy. So on the 340, the 340 has a stock turbo. It used to have a Flomax, but the previous owner returned it to stock before he sold it. Does my car tick? Oh, yeah. So um, question is, if I turn off the cold start, like put on cold start reduction, does my car tick? Usually that means that the exhaust is hitting the brace underneath the car. So just double check that. Look under where your mid pipe is because it'll rattle and you can hear it kind of like it ticks and then it slowly like stops. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's TU pump with 102 Ron and meth enough for 800 wheel horsepower. So the TU pump doesn't matter anymore. Once you start running meth or port injection, it's about how much fuel you're flowing. Um, you know, in theory it is, I can probably guess that there are some people that are close to there, but they don't have a TU pump. I don't know how big your nozzles would have to be to hit 800 wheel horsepower with a TU pump and meth. That would be probably a lot more risk than you want to take on. What's my opinion on spark plugs? I just use stock. 
Uh, did I screw myself buying Big Boost versus the new Kratos kit? Would I still buy a full frame now? Yes, I would. Like on the 340, I probably wouldn't. But on the 340, I'm not planning on upgrading the turbo. If I did upgrade the turbo, I would go with something that I could just run on low boost and not push it really hard. But for like a send it kit where I want to have fun and do what I enjoy, I'm going to go with a full frame kit. The Kratos one coming out will be nice. But like I said, the numbers that they've shown hasn't really like been groundbreaking because they didn't push it. They ran it with just a Dorch Stage 2. So they need to put a Precision Raceworks or EOS port injection kit on there and send it and show us what it can really do. And then we can kind of judge from that. I know some people are already placing orders, but that's what I would wait for. Let's see, I've got this weird thing at the drag strip. I turn my car off after a run and then turn it on right before a run. It'll cut injectors like fuel starve. That does sound kind of weird. I've never ran into anything like that. Um, hopefully you're doing like a little bit of a cool down. I mean, when you're running it back, don't just park it and shut it off. You can let it run for a little bit, pop the hood, um, you know, kind of depending on your setup, that's going to be more critical, but I haven't heard of that issue before. It sounds like what you're saying is if you turn it off, right at the end of a run when you go to turn it back on it'll cut out and that that doesn't sound good let's see have i heard anything about turning off cold starts and it harming the car nope i turned off cold start in 2019 when boot mode came out and i have not turned it back on since Jamie, please stop trying all of my friends, please. This is a friendly environment. Let's see. All right, let's switch back to YouTube. Thanks again, everybody. This is starting to move fast. I'm gonna try to keep up. Appreciate the support, Philip. Ooh, radium low pressure fuel pump kit. I have not seen any news on that one so i will definitely check that out i did not know that, that was coming but radium obviously is a really high quality company so if they're doing something for the supra let's start yelling and screaming at them to make one for gen one that that sounds pretty awesome Yeah, for 700, you're going to need more, unfortunately. I'm going to be releasing two videos, um, should be this week. One will be for the uh, Performance Fueling Solutions fuel pump, because I think that's pretty cool. So we're going to talk about that. That just came out. And then we're also just going to talk about low-pressure fuel pumps in general, because we don't have a lot of videos that just talk about the limits of the fuel pump and what we kind of need to pay attention to. Um, so I'm going to try to create that. I was actually, Jamie, I was staring at your video while we were in the group chat for probably about an hour trying to look at all the details of the different pumps because it's hard to find. Nobody even posts pictures of their pumps before they install them. So Jamie has two videos because he's installed the Vader one and the Precision Raceworks one. Um, so that's a good resource to see how they actually look as well. But yeah, we're going to talk about that probably either Thursday or Friday. I'll be posting that video. Best recommendation for 600 watt horsepower daily. I just need to make that a video, man. That's one of my most common questions. And I don't know why it's always 600 watt horsepower. Somebody must tell you guys just enough information to be dangerous. And then they just leave you hanging. Because 600 to 650 is like the perfect happy spot for the B58, in my opinion. And it's really easy to get to. Upgrade your fuel pump, upgrade your turbo, tune on an ethanol mix. Very, very simple. So, and I mean, the cheapest turbo to get you there right now is the Flomex. We did get a price on the Kratos one. I don't know if you guys saw it. It's $42.75. So that's like a pure turbo, but there's no core charge. So I said in the video, all their other ones are more expensive, and it's definitely the most expensive one. It's twice the price of a Flomex. 
or almost twice. So that's the other thing to consider. But yeah, I mean, if you want it for cheap, Flowmax, Torch Stage 2, send it. Buy it used if you can find it. Let's see, 700 horsepower and 650 DI only. With the Dorch Stage 2, it, it will get you close. Just like 600 is around the limit for a TU pump, 700 is around the limit for a Dorch Stage 2. Like the same thing, you got to get your ethanol mix perfect and you got to get your tune perfect. Really dial in your torque curve and let horsepower carry all the way to red line, and you'll just barely nut tap 700. Appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you. Now we got another question about getting 600 horsepower. <laughs> yeah, the word has got out 600 horsepower is the cheat code. Can I daily a thousand horsepower because my mom says I can't? Bro, your mom says you can't? Are we doing this right now? Your mom says you can't daily a thousand horsepower. I mean, she bought your car, so I don't know. You got to manage that conversation. If it has eco mode, you should be fine. Yeah, that's the one. See, have I replaced my injectors? Thankfully, no. Um, and that's why I haven't posted a video on it. A lot of people ask me, when is my injector DIY coming out? And I actually plan on doing one with the 3 Series, since the cylinder head is probably going to need to come off anyway. Um, but I'm not a big fan of replacing stuff or changing stuff that is not broken, especially something sensitive like your fuel system, because that can introduce failures. So... I haven't touched them on the 4 Series because I haven't had an issue with them, but I'll probably be able to make a DIY with the 3 Series over the next month or so. If I'm running... Oh, this is a good question. All right, so if I'm running a Dorch Stage 2 and an EFR 9274, what would be causing high-pressure fuel pump dips if I'm only running 25 PSI? Shouldn't it be able to handle it? But, so keep in mind, guys, your high-pressure fuel pump is limited based on RPM. So just like your turbo can make more power at higher RPM, your fuel pump can flow more fuel at higher RPM. So I ramp up boost. I think I answered this question during the last live stream. Um, or no, this was Jamie's live stream. You asked me how much boost I was running. And I run 29 PSI, but I am not running 29 PSI throughout the entire ref range. At the hit, like around 3,500, when boost ramps up, I'm hitting 23 to 24, and it slowly ramps up all the way towards red line as more fuel becomes available. So if you're hitting 25 PSI or you know whatever your peak boost is way down low, and you only have an upgraded high-pressure fuel pump, you're going to struggle. The only way that you can get that much torque that early on is to run port injection. So that's the other limit of being DI only. You can hit your horsepower goals and you can run the amount of boost that you want to run but usually it's going to be way up in the rev range when you have the fuel available to support it so talk to your tuner just see and also 25 psi in a 9274 is a lot that's more than 25 psi on like a pure 800 or something you're flowing a lot of air so talk to your tuner ramp up your boost and ramp up your horsepower as you have fuel available and that's what will allow you to basically make the most out of your setup. Let's see. Should I replace six if one failed or replace the one that failed? It's really hard to say, guys. So this is an injector question again. Um, like I said, I'm not a fan of messing with stuff that isn't broken, but the injectors do not have like a single entry point where something can contaminate it, right? Most people say they had this issue after they replaced a high pressure fuel pump or filled up with bad gas or, you know, just some like freak accident. But if it's something in your fuel system that's clogging your injectors, it's not only going to clog one. But that doesn't mean that your injector is clogged either. Your injector is an electrical component that can fail. 
So if I have one injector that fails, I'm probably only going to replace that one. And if you're one of those people that are like, oh, well, two days later, another one failed, that might be where you consider replacing all six. Even though it sucks to kind of roll the dice and just see, um, you know, that's just kind of how I think. And especially because they're expensive too. They're like 300 bucks a pop. So is the Ross PCV delete a must? Uh, definitely not. This is an upgrade. Um, it's like preventative maintenance, I guess, you know, because my PCV never failed. I didn't really expect it to fail anytime soon. But if I can just delete it and not have to worry about it, then that was kind of a cool option, too. I know a lot of people just buy like the $25 PCV replacement mm -hmm. kits and like, sorry, um, they buy those PCV replacement kits and just keep like a trim tool in their car so they can just pop the cap off and replace it when they need to. That works the exact same way. You know, it's just kind of based on your budget and what you want to deal with. Oh, good luck. Yeah, keep an eye out for Jamie's video for the precision fuel pump install. Because that's definitely a high quality kit. Dock race or big booze? Jamie said dock race. Easy. The fastest turbo for the B58? That's a good question. I mean, generally speaking, I think most of the people now are making more power with precision kits. I mean, the fastest Supras, like pretty much, I think all of the eight second Supras are running top mount precision turbos. It's not the best for daily driving, in my opinion. I don't really like the turbo design, but for racing purposes, I mean, they're definitely putting in work. I think everybody has like either 6780 or, or 6870 or uh gosh, I can't I can't remember the other one. But now Mikey's getting ready to upgrade his as well, so he'll be getting faster too. Yeah, Jamie, your your words are all messed up. What Jamie meant to say was dock race over big boost. Sorry, he spelled it weird. Let's see. All right, let's switch back to YouTube. Oh, thank you, thank you, Pure B58. Appreciate that, man. You guys definitely don't have to do that, <laughs> but thank you. Let's see. Does an ELSD act like one to one, like an LSD? So the ELSD is not an LSD. The ELSD is breaking to help the other wheel get some traction and get more power so it's not an lsd it's it's going to prevent you from like landing in the weeds and spinning off the track but it's not going to help you accelerate around the turn and put more power down to the outside wheel like an actual lsd thoughts on the rk auto works manifold i'm not a fan currently just my opinion. They, there have been like mixed results on it. So I think it had some issues with bleeding initially. They added like an extra bleed port to the back of the manifold so that it would be easier to get all the air out. But some people still seem like they're kind of having issues with it. It's definitely stronger than stock, but I don't think the cooling aspect is as good as something like EOS. If an F30 and G20 are both free, there's only one thing that matters to me if it has a manual transmission. So if the F30 has a manual transmission, I'm getting that. If the F30 has an automatic, then I'm getting the G20. So that, that's just my opinion. I like the G20 a lot. The interior is miles ahead of the F30. They come factory with an LSD. Like they just have a much better drivetrain, power plant, like everything is set up better from the factory. Um, the only downside, of course, is a lot of them can't be tuned and you can't get it in manual. All right. Is the Flomax 2.5 the most reliable, cheapest turbo? Uh, the GC is cheaper and it's pretty reliable as well. The Vargas GC, it just won't be... It won't have the total potential that a Flowmax will have. 
So it kind of depends on your budget and your horsepower goals. I was told that Pure 50 burns oil. I haven't seen it, but that's what some people have said. Um, so all of the Pures have some oil consumption. It's not really just the 850. Some people have had good luck with it. Some people have had good luck for a while, and then it starts consuming oil. And then some people, it just consumes oil as soon as they install it. Um, you know, so they'll install like catch cans or different things to try to capture it. But it's just kind of something that they do. I don't know if it's a deal with like seals inside or what it is, honestly. But that, that has been an issue for a while. We just don't talk about it a lot because people don't care. Why the 440? Because 440 is better than all of the other ones. I actually, a lot of people don't know, but I bought this car brand new. I went to the dealer. I spec'd it, ordered it, picked it up in South Carolina, and then drove it home from the performance center. So, like, I specifically picked this car and spec'd it the exact way that I wanted to. And definitely wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, the precisions have no coolant. They're only oil fed. So the oil does the cooling and the lubrication. Um, that's why a lot of them are cheaper. You know, it's, it's just kind of how it is. And we were having a good discussion about that in another group because somebody was calling precision a knockoff company. Because I guess initially they were making knockoffs of Garrett. Um, I haven't looked into the history a lot. But just in general, like I'm just not a big fan of them. I know they work. I know they make a lot of power and some of the fastest cars have them, but that's not my only priority for my personal cars. Uh, is anybody making upgraded axles or drive shafts? So there are a lot of people making them, just nobody has them on the shelf right now. I think there is one company that was working on it and I cannot think of who it was. Somebody mentioned it in one of the A90 groups, but pretty much everybody is taking measurements from your existing drive shaft or axles and then building them for you when you order. So if you want some in advance, reach out to drive shaft shop or, you know, any company that sells them and they will make you one. Who's got the fastest BMW B58? Uh, right now it's one of the guys in New York. Um, there's somebody going very, very fast. I guess I'll just put it that way. Any way to make the 9174 spool quicker without nitrous? Not really. Um, I mean, if you've got a turbo kit and it's set up like it bolts on, then what you get is what you get. There are some things that your tuner can do to try to increase how quickly it spools by optimizing AFRs and timing. Um, to kind of accelerate your exhaust gases coming out and lower RPM. But nitrous is going to be probably the easiest ways to get really quick spool, especially if you're launching. Okay, you guys are going to make me try this. <laughs> All right, so we've got a noob in the chat. So the question is, what oil weight should I run? Um, sorry, guys, this he just got his car. So the oil weight can vary a little bit. Usually I stick with something that's like uh, vegetable based. You can try something like, I mean, canola works pretty well. It, it just kind of depends on what's available at your grocery store. But um, yeah, I mean, hopefully this helps. I know you're just kind of getting started on your car and you'll have a lot of good luck in the future if you keep asking questions like this. So thank you for your time. Here's another one. So what is the quarter mile stock turbo record for Gen 1? Right now it's a 10.5. And it's an M240. And he did everything. He stripped out his car, you know, took out all the seats, ran drag mode on XHP, um, sent it on a track. He didn't have radials. I think he was on like Indy 500s, but, you know, good prep. They had like a private track day for him and his friends and they made sure it was, you know, optimized. So, yeah, that's how that worked. All right. Yeah, you guys are testing me. I didn't even know that was a feature to answer questions like that. 
I'm guessing he's not the only one knocking on the doors of eights. That's a fair assumption. How long was my install for the motive and PI plate? So everything that I do on my car takes a while because I don't get to install it all at once, especially because I'm filming videos. But if I was just to install it right now, especially with my experience of doing it already, it'd probably take like five hours. Um, the motive is actually really easy to install because of the diagrams that they provide. But a lot of people just, they mess up. You know, you tap into the wrong wire or whatever you're looking at slightly the wrong diagram for your car or not counting the pins correctly. And that can cause a lot of issues. I was just helping somebody with that um, over this past week. And he finally realized that one of the wires weren't connected right. So that's usually what it comes down to. It's, it's not a difficult install, but I guess it's just like easy to make a mistake. Uh, okay, so you want me to elaborate on G20s that can't be tuned. So G20s came out in 2020. Up until June of 2020, the DMEs could be unlocked. Either they could be OBD flashed or some of them needed a bench unlock. After June 2020, they cannot be flashed at all without sending your DME off to be cloned right now. So boot mode doesn't work. MHD doesn't work. EQ tech doesn't work. You'll have to clone it with a DME from a car that was built before the June 2020 cutoff and then install that on your car and that will allow you to flash it. But BMW updated their encryption so it can't be unlocked the same way. So only the 2020 G20s and the very early 2021s can be tuned. GC Plus, don't get it. Do not get a GC Plus. Let's see, I keep screwing this up. Yeah, I'll switch over to YouTube. I keep screwing up the questions on Instagram. Um, no, Hezzy is likely the fastest. He's up there. He's definitely up there. I know one other F30 that is going very fast. Does my B58 make a slight whine from 1500 to 3000 RPM? No. Um, when I had my exhaust leak, it did. So maybe that's something that you might want to check on. Make sure you don't have any leaks at any of the clamps. Check your downpipe, check your midpipe, um, and check for boost leaks as well. That's always a good option too. You said G20 has LSD, does G30 also have it? Not to my knowledge. The thing with the G20 is like the M light package includes the LSD. So it's almost like an F30 with a full M performance kit, right? So they have like bigger brakes. They come with an LSD, adaptive suspension. All that stuff is standard because you can't get like a regular G20 340. They're all M340s. So that's why they come with LSDs. And as far as I'm aware, the M240s are the same and the M440s are the same. Thank you, Xavier. Appreciate the support. You've been really supporting a lot. I see you, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. 2022 X5 with JB4. Will a Pure 800 get me to 550 on 93? Uh, it's really hard to say. I don't think so. I, I think it would be very hard, especially with a JB4. I am seeing a lot of people push a JB4 very hard unless they have meth and they use the JB4 as a meth controller. Just 93 octane, it's hard to say. And I think because I was reading about this over the weekend, somebody was complaining that they weren't getting enough support with their J before and they wanted to do all these things and all the tuners were telling them like fueling is always the limitation with a J before because you can't modify the fuel tables. So yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend trying to do that. For eight HP owners, my car has become jerky in first gear. Has anyone had this issue? Happens with XHP stage three and two. I will try the stock tune soon. Yeah, I mean, that would be my first recommendation. I guess if anybody else in the chat sees this question, feel free to um, 
you know, throw it out there. But I think that a lot of the time that's either due to fluid or maybe like just needing like a transmission service can make it jerky. I've seen the same thing in like dual clutch cars. So make sure that your fluids are not leaking or anything. Let's see. Is the M340 faster than Gen 1 mod for mod? No. I mean, it's going to be faster with just a downpipe because the Gen 1 downpipe is smaller. But as soon as you add a TU pump on an F30, it, it's going to be the same. And then once you start upgrading from there, it's pretty much even. If I was a turbo, you'd wrap me in a turbo blanket and cuddle with me. So you have to be careful because uh, I catch on fire sometimes. That's the only thing. I might get you back. What is the race thrust bearing? Oh, I just lost it. What is the race thrust bearing when referring to a Flomax? So this is basically something that's supposed to upgrade it to let it handle more abuse. Um, if you guys have paid attention to like Sean's comments in the threads, Basically, everything that he complains about, tuning issues, throttle closures, people running it on off-the-shelf maps, all of that stuff, the race thrust bearing is basically supposed to make it more resilient. Um, I don't know how many people that I've talked to with Flowmaxes that have picked it versus not to say that it really makes a big difference, um, but that's really what it is. I mean, if this is like your end-all goal, you want your Flowmax to be the fastest hybrid Flowmax ever then that's something that will allow you to get a little more juice out of it without it breaking. That's basically what it's there for. So I don't think it's needed, especially for most setups, but if you really want to push it, then they kind of recommend it. But that, I mean, that turbo has had really good luck. I don't think everybody gets it and I haven't really heard of many failures. What's my fastest quarter? So I'll post my draggy after this. My fastest quarter, I think is like a 12.5. Um, at like 120 something miles an hour. Um, and you can see everything in there. I mean, it's like my first gear spins, hooks, bogs out, shift a second. And then I kind of grab really good. My three, four shift is great. That's why I'm able to do pretty good 60 to 130s and 100 to 200 times. But uh, for quarter mile, my launch going from one to two to three, it's just slow. And especially being rear wheel drive. It's, it's just slow. I feel like people don't know about inner chillers. So that's a good topic as well. I don't know if I'm going to tackle it yet, but um, there is a big issue with the design of our cars and the way that an inner chiller works. It's not really a plug and play setup like most. Um, a lot of you have maybe like lost air conditioning or had different issues because the coolant in your inner cooler was low like you were having a radiator leak or whatever. And that's a part of the issue. We're using the coolant in our intercooler circuit as a part of our AC system. So just tapping into that with the AC doesn't work or it's, it's not the same as other cars. So yeah, I, I know a lot of people have asked about it. A lot of people don't know about it, but it's probably not something that's coming to our cars anytime soon. Scrolling through these comments on Instagram really sucks. Let's see. Oh, thank you, Jack. Thank you, thank you. Uh, how can I get to 550 without meth for shipping your ECU? Those are your two best options, man. I mean, the problem is that you're going to need fuel to get there, okay? And it's not just high quality fuel, it's a tune that allows you to run enough fuel to get there. Um, I remember like with the JB4 on the F30, we were limited to like 420 wheel horsepower or so. I don't know if you guys even remember that. Anybody that was here back in the JB4 days, we had like a fuel system lock or limit or whatever that everybody was trying to figure out how we could work around. That has not been fixed. The JB4 cannot get past the fuel table limits in the stock tune. 
They can ask more for more boost. They can adjust for more timing, but they cannot ask for more fuel. The car has to automatically adjust for that, and there's a limit on how much it can adjust. So that's why I'm not sure that it'll get there. Maybe it's different with the TU engine. You know, I'm not sure, but 550 is a lot. So that's why I'm not sure you'll get there. You might be able to get up to like 450 to 500 with just a JB4, but um, just double check. Like, instead of paying attention to us, look at super forms. Go look at what the super guys are doing, and that's going to give you a good idea of what you can expect on your car. Because a lot of those guys are still pushing their cars on JB4s. All right. Let's see. If I didn't have Odin, who would I choose? Yeah, you guys are trying to start like a real fight. So, I mean, there are a lot of really good tuners, a lot of people that have I've been in contact with and that I recommend. Um, you know, Marin Tuned is very good. Wedge Performance is very good. Doug Newton is very good. Juan over at Big Booth has, I think, all of the F30 records at this time, or most of them. Um so obviously he's really good too. He makes it the turbo kits and he also tunes cars. Um, so yeah, those are typically the people that I kind of recommend. David Shoup. Um, those are all good guys and they tune across all the different platforms, boot mode, MHD, MG Flasher. You can pick from one of those. Let's see, just ordered the Flowmax plus running the TU pump with a high flow cat, 93 octane. Should I upgrade any of those or anything else? If your goal is around like 550 horsepower, you don't need to upgrade anything else. Just get a tune. If E85 is corn, is it okay to use corn vegetable oil for E85? So oil and fuel are two different things. You can use the vegetable oil in your engine, but you cannot pour it into your fuel tank. It, it's not, if that makes sense, no, it doesn't make sense. You, you can't do that. Oil and fuel are two different things. It's like, it's different in how you churn it. That's what makes it oil versus fuel. No idea why I'd have TCU limiters when no limiters are flashed. I really don't know. That one is a strange one. But what I can say is, um, you know, like I mentioned that I was tuned by Marin for a while. Even with Odin, we ran into several limiters and you can see the flag in your tune. You can see the flag in your logs, but there might be like four or five different tables that need to be adjusted to address it. So work with your tuner. If you have somebody that's diligent, they will go through the tables and find what's wrong and fix it. Because I think I had four or five tunes where nothing changed or the car was breaking up and I have a manual. I don't have a transmission tune and it was still hitting limiters for different things. So um, there, there's just a lot that even like for a setup that's been proven on your specific car, it might be unique and need to be addressed differently. So just work with your tuner. Oh, this is another good question. I just started seeing people talk about this. Um, so the question is for an oil change, does the car need to be level or can you just jack up the front? And the question I guess it's coming from the location of the drain plug because the oil pan is on the bottom of the car and most cars have the drain plug like kind of in the back corner. So when you pick it up, it's kind of pointed straight down when you jack up the front. Ours is like right in the middle and point straight down. So I guess some people have started saying that you can't jack up the front of your car or jacking it up is wrong. Um, keep in mind, you never get all the oil out of your car. OK, if you pull your engine, drain the oil and take it apart, oil is going to continue coming out for like several days. So you're never going to get all the oil out of your car anyway. So when you do your oil change, if you have like a little nut hair of oil sitting in the bottom of the pan, that's not the end of the world. I jack up the front of my car for oil, all of my oil changes. So if you can do it level, cool. If you just want to jack up the front, it works just fine. All right, got a lot of new people. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Have I heard of an issue where the car is on, and then when you turn it off, there is a knocking sound around the intake manifold area? I've been looking for 
I've been looking at a few forums where people are having the same problem and they say it's the eccentric shaft. Oh yeah. So I have heard of that issue. Um, I can't remember what it was. It was either the motor or one of the solenoids towards the back of the cylinder head that was like locking up or trying to adapt, like run an adaptation. Um, God, I'll have to look that up, but look up, look up Vanos issues, like solenoid issues and see if that starts aligning with any of the issues that you're having. And of course, scan for codes. It might not throw a check engine light, but just scan for codes and see if there's anything, um, you know, to tell you information there. All right, guys, we got a, another question. Sorry, not that noob again. What's wrong with the GC Plus? So my problem with the GC Plus is it takes a lot more to make power with that turbo. Like, I've literally had tuners say that it woke up at 33 PSI. That's not, like, realistic. Like, saying you need 33 PSI to wake up and put out rated horsepower or, like, really start flying, that's not reasonable to me. There are other turbos that's full faster, make more overall torque, more overall power for cheaper. And that's what I'm a fan of. And I've also seen a lot of them break. People post up pictures of the wheels coming apart and things like that. Um, I think the words that I heard from somebody that tested it and posted like a quick review and then got annoyed with all the comments, he basically said one turbo can take abuse and the other one can't, you know what I mean? And that's how I look at it. You know, even if you're not designing it to work in certain setups, like it shouldn't break easily. It shouldn't have so many issues. It should be able to handle some abuse. So I'm just not a fan of it. Let's see. What are your thoughts on Dynan compared to other tuning companies? So Dynan is fine. Um, they're the equivalent of like APR and Volkswagen World, where basically all of their stuff is more expensive because they have a better brand name, but they don't really do a lot more for that money. Um, especially nowadays, I think they're struggling with like their warranty claims and stuff like that. So it works. I know a lot of people just have good luck with dining and they feel like they're tried and treat setups. But um, for me, I would rather go with something that's a little bit better bang for buck. I mean, literally everything about them is so modest, like even their lowering springs don't go as low as everybody else. Their tunes don't make as much power. Everything is just a little bit softer, a little bit less aggressive, and they charge more for it. So um you know, it works fine. I think I'm still waiting for more people to provide feedback on the actual flash tuner. That's the only thing that I haven't heard a lot about, but everything else, it's just, it's just kind of meh. So if, if you're going for like the full package, go for it. I know a lot of people like that stuff, um, but I just don't really recommend it because it's, it's not, it's not the most valuable products. Let's see. When I do pulls with traction control on my car, it throws a drivetrain malfunction if I spin. And if I remove it, it doesn't have any ideas. I mean, if you're putting down good power, that's common. That, that's not a problem. That just means that the car isn't designed to handle that much power. I know even like when I'm on the rollers, like if I have my hood open, it throws a drivetrain malfunction and goes into limp mode. If I have my hood closed, it doesn't. Our car has very sensitive monitoring of like wheel speeds and things like that. So, um, you know, it's not a surprise. Let's see, B58 sauce. Yeah, it's available to anybody. Just buy a 340. Yeah, the B58 sounds really good. I think my favorite thing about my car is everybody asks me what exhaust I have or what exhaust tips I have you know, and all of this stuff, it's literally a catless downpipe and a muffler delete with eBay exhaust tips that I had welded on. So my total exhaust cost was $250. So take that as you will. What do I think about the dining mid pipe with a muffler delete and a high flow downpipe? So that is a straight pipe, my friend. That will be very, very loud. Um, 
you know, if you can handle it, go for it. That's actually what's on the 340. It has a straight pipe right now. Um, and once I get to driving it a little more, I'll figure out what I want to do. But, um, yeah, just don't spend a lot of money just to get a straight pipe. That would be my only recommendation if that's your plan. Let's see, I have a Pure 800 TU pump, flex fuel tin with stock air box. Would I recommend sticking with it or an MST intake? If you're happy with how the car performs, I would just stick with it. The intake will definitely be louder. Um, it might spool a little bit faster, and depending on how sensitive your tune is, you might need to adjust it a little bit just to make sure you don't overboost. But um, it's not really going to give you like any power. Boot mode or MHD? Yeah, actually, I need to post that video too. I have all my notes for that video um, to compare all the different tuning software, and I will create that soon. Right now, I'm on MHD. <coughs> and uh, would it sound good? So straight pipe sounds amazing when you are flying. When you are driving around town, that's up to you. I guess I'll put it that way. A lot of cars sound good, wide open throttle. So the kind of question to you is, does it matter to you if it's just booming off of buildings and droning while you're driving around town? Because that can get annoying sometimes. Did I see the M340 with bead locks? Yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. There are, there are a lot of people doing crazy things with commuter cars right now. Like welds are not normal, guys. Bead locks are not normal. And we're just like, eh, since I'm making 600 wheel horsepower, like let's get some Mickey Thompson ET streets and go run some nines. Like that's that's crazy. It's, it's really crazy. I approve, but it's crazy. Where do I put my wiper fluid in? Oh, yeah, this is a really good question. So once you actually fix your starter, you'll be able to find the wiper fluid. It's actually right next to all the bits of your starter bearing that are probably on the floor of your garage. So you'll be able to fix that easy. Let's see. Appreciate it. Black Panther, thank you for the support. It's blinker fluid. Don't worry, he doesn't know any better. He he drives a Pontiac. We'll we'll let it slide this time. Am I in the sixes? Yes, I am in the sixes, sixty to one thirty. Does gas make my car faster? Usually, I mean I have not been faster on my car without gas, if that's the question. I mean, usually when I have gas in my car, it's faster than no gas. But log it, like run a log and see how it performs with no gas. Let's see, what spark plug would I recommend? Stick with your stock plugs. The M340 plugs are different than the 340 plugs. TU plugs are different than Gen 1. Same brands, they have Champion and NGK versions, but um, they're slightly different. So just run, if you have a TU engine, run TU plugs. If you have a Gen 1 engine, run Gen 1 plugs. What's up, Nightfall? <laughs> What's up, bro? Get your leg fixed so we can get back outside. <clears throat> when am I going to get a hydraulic lift, bro? Bro, like, bro. I, I'm with you there. I can't even answer it. Just know I'm with you there. Well, that's interesting. So Jake is saying that BMW is offering a three-year unlimited oil changes for $200, but your car has to be five years old or over 60,000 miles. That's kind of interesting. I, I don't know how many of you guys realize this, but I have done my own oil change in the past five years of ownership. I've done it twice. So all of my oil changes were done by BMW up until 2021. And all my like E85 tuning, custom tuning, all of that stuff was done on zero W20 factory BMW oil. So I'm, I'm a fan of it. 200 is a lot though, if you've got FCP, because basically you just buy you know, one oil change and then it's free every year after that. So 
consider that too. Oh, I'm way behind. Sorry, guys. Thanks to everybody that's new on here. Um, so I keep seeing questions about the three series. I'm not skipping it. I just don't want to keep repeating myself. So um, just real quick for those of you that didn't hear, the 340 is most likely going to need a cylinder head or a cylinder head rebuild. I'm just waiting to be able to find the time to film um, the process of diagnosing it to upload that video. And I just haven't had time. So, but we have a good idea of what's wrong with it. <coughs> carbon fiber turbo. So you guys are laughing, but somebody just posted carbon fiber um, connecting rods. So... this nice scroll so do we need a low pressure fuel pump to run e85 and pi on a pure 800 so again i'm going to be making a video on low pressure fuel pump stuff later this week it'll be posted um low pressure fuel pump upgrades are going to be needed around 700 wheel horsepower depending on ethanol content and things like that if you have a gen one and you already have like a Dodge stage two or something like that and you start seeing fuel pressure dips it's your low pressure fuel pump. If you add PI and start pushing it, it's your low pressure fuel pump. So it just kind of depends on how how hard you're pushing it. I'm going to be running full E85 with PI on my car, but I'm not going to need a low pressure fuel pump because I'm not making that much power. Have I used all the off-the-shelf tunes? No, I have not. I have not used the MHD or MG Flasher, like all their off-the-shelf tunes, and I have not used the newer boot mode off-the-shelf tunes. Have I downloaded the 440? Yes, like five times. So if you check out my channel on YouTube, I've got the videos of all the dyno runs. Um, I show everything from stage one up to my current tune, basically how much power my current tune should be making. I have an MST intake only on my 440 and I need help building my car. So I have a video on my channel um, that's just kind of, I forget what it's called, like, B58 tuning guide or something like that. Gosh, it's my most viewed video. So if you go to my channel and sort for most popular or top views, that first video will give you a good kind of starting point for how to tune your car and what kind of modifications you want to do. But just start with stage one. A stage one tune is really good and supports a lot of power. It's a lot of fun and really easy. What's the best street tire for rear wheel drive? I mean, if you just want like a summer tire, Continental Extreme Contact Sport is really good. It performs really well in rain and grip, rain and grips pretty well. Um, and then Michelin Pilot Super Sports, of course, are good as well. They're just more expensive. Let's see. All right. What do I think about Precision Turbo 6466? So... This is kind of like along the lines of what I was talking about before. I know a lot of people, I think, are running the 6466 or 6870 turbos, um, and they perform well. You know, I think the 6466 is probably a better street turbo. The 6870 is more like a race turbo. It has a lot of top end, a lot of horsepower capacity, but it spools a lot slower. So I think it works well if that's like your goal is just to make as much power as possible, but I'm a bigger fan of like the Garrett or EFR turbos, just personally. <laughs> Do they make a Pure 850 kit for the 2018 M240? Yes. So they make a Pure 850 for every version of the B58. It's the same turbo they just put a slightly larger compressor wheel on it, same exhaust wheel. So when you send your stock turbo in and they modify it, they just put a different wheel in it for it to make it an 850 instead of an 800. So as long as you specify it on the order, they can build it for you. 
what off the shelf tune is best. The best off the shelf tune is a custom tune. Do I recommend port before getting an upgraded turbo or just do everything all at once? I like turbo upgrades. I am a big fan of turbo upgrades. I like how they drive. I like how they sound. Um, port is just a headache, man. It, it's really just not fun. And I know I did it on my car, um, but I really wasn't planning on it. You know, um, I just got the motive or the motivation from Dimmer Network to do it. You know, they partnered with me to help put it on my car. But I was very happy with how it was on just a Dorch Stage 2. It's very simple, very easy to run, no additional controllers, tuning, and like anything to monitor or dial in. You know, it just, it kind of sucks adding that additional failure point, you know, potential failure point. <clears throat> like I posted as soon as I installed my port injection, I turned on my car for my test drive and the whole garage smells like fuel because it's like, spraying fuel out of the back of the fuel rail. And so there was an issue that I had to fix. And I don't see that happening anytime soon again, but any of the injectors can fail, the controller can fail, you know, it's just not ideal. So it's what you need if you wanna get past a certain point in horsepower, but I definitely don't think that would be like a first mod before upgrading a turbo. Tur turbo upgrades are so nice because you can just slap it on there and just drive the car. It's just like it was before, just with more airflow. But I do know, like, there are some guys running really fast with stock turbo on the TU engines because they run port injection and intake manifolds upgraded, trans, like all these different things to get as much as they can out of the stock turbo. It works too, but I would just rather upgrade the turbo. If I ever swap to a new turbo, which would you pick? And can I sell your next top mount exhaust manifold? So I'm going to assume that you're asking if I'm switching out my EFR. And the next one that I actually bought was an 8474. But then I realized that I wasn't going that far yet. So I returned it. But that would be what I'd do next, an 8474. Um, the world's fastest 440i is on an 8474. And it's pulls just as fast as mine, which may more top end power. I think it supports like an extra 150 horsepower. So, and I'm not selling my top mount anytime. Do I rather a top mount turbo or a sleeper look? Brother, you know what's in there? Come on. <laughs> I am not worried about being a sleeper. I'm not worried about trying to impress anybody or surprise anybody. I don't care about being the fastest or any of that. I'm out here to have fun, and a top mount is fun. I promise you that, and it turns heads for sure. Let's see. If I would, please also post Gen 2 info. Pilots hook a lot better than the Connies. I think you're responding to something I said previously. Um, I can't remember what I was talking about, but as far as the tires, in my experience, the pilots don't hook that much better. Like the way that I tell people is the Continentals are about 95% of the Michelin performance at 60% of the cost. So that's why I like Continentals and they perform a lot better in the rain, in my opinion. So that's just been my experience. I'm, I'm not a fan of paying for Michelins. I think they're just like some other companies that can charge more because of their name. You know, they're offered on so many cars from the OEM now. It's just like there's brand loyalty behind it. And that's why they can charge so much for their regular summer tires. They're not really doing anything special. And the Continentals wear a lot better, too. Let's see. What are the next plans for the 440? So right now I'm just going to try to enjoy it. If I do want to push it, I need an upgraded clutch and an intake manifold. The clutch is just because it won't handle any more torque. The manifold, because I don't feel comfortable pushing more power on the stock manifold. Um, do I get high IETs with the top mount? I do not. And the only thing that I have on my car is the CSF heat exchanger. Um, like I said, I have a stock manifold. So IETs haven't really been an issue for me. I'm not sure if others have a problem, but 
Um, there are a lot of cars pushing upwards of like 650 to 700 with the stock manifold. So it just kind of depends. It's not probably going to last forever at those horsepower levels, but um, there are people that are making it work. So, and keep in mind, our cars handle high IATs pretty well because it doesn't start pulling timing until it's up to like 150 Fahrenheit or something like that. It's like 65 degrees Celsius. So even if your IATs are up to like the 120s or 130s, the car can handle it. Might not make as much power, but it's not like dangerous. <coughs> and I don't have any heat soak, especially with the heat exchanger. That was the biggest difference is it prevented heat soak. So anytime I come off throttle after a pull, my IATs drop right back down. I don't know if that would be different with the stock heat exchanger. Um, thoughts on the 9274? I think it's a good turbo. Um, I think it's only like 50 horsepower over the 8474. So it's just a little bit more of a sacrifice and spool than I would want for barely any more horsepower. That's why I would go with the 8474. Again, I'm just in it to have fun. I'm not out to like break records or anything. Um, but if you just want, you know, the fastest setup with that kind of exhaust housing, the 9274 will get you there. That one does support more power. Um, Toyo or Mickey Thompson's. So I know a lot of people run Toyos, but those are not really a radial. Okay. So, I mean, you can run Toyos on like a road course. They kind of have street car sidewalls and they're designed to be like a street tire or a streetable tire, not really a street tire. Um, and the Mickey Thompson's like they're cheater slicks in most cases. So you'll go a lot faster on Mickey Thompson's and have a lot more room to launch harder on Mickey Thompson's with more grip. But the Toyotas will have better street manners. You won't have to deal as much with like sway and things like that um, because it's just better designed for street purposes. And that's a big reason why I don't run a super aggressive tire on my car because I like to take on ramps at speed. I like to go around turns fast and I'm not going to deal with like the rear end of my car feeling nervous. That's not my thing. Any more exhaust videos on the 440? Not right now. I can definitely make some. I've mostly been pulling recordings from my dash cam and it doesn't always have the best audio because I'm like listening to music and stuff while I'm driving around. So I have to like be very deliberate in filming those kinds of videos if I wanna make more of them. That's, that's the only downside. Even like if I wanna post those videos on YouTube, I have to mute them, otherwise they'll get demonetized because it has like copyrighted music and stuff in it. So I'll see what I can do. Maybe later this summer, I'll be able to put something else together, but I don't. I don't have anything in the line right now. And I think I've made a couple, I've made like two or three. All right, let's see. Do I recommend downpipe wrap on a bottom out full frame? It doesn't hurt. Um, I have mine wrapped on my car because everything is right next to the valve cover. So I wrapped the downpipe, I put a turbo blanket on to help prevent it from getting too hot. With a bottom mount kit, it's not as big of a deal, but it doesn't hurt. I mean, there's still some things down there that you probably don't want to see a whole lot of heat. So it's kind of up to you. If you're already there and you have it, it's probably like, why not? You know, just don't expect it to make like a big difference. It's kind of like the same thing as some of the other stuff is just preventative maintenance. Uh, what car should I buy? 340 or 440? So that's kind of up to you. Right. I mean, like I said, I ordered my car brand new. I spec'd it brand new. I bought exactly what I wanted. Um, I still have my spreadsheet from when I bought my car because I'm annoying. So I put all the cars that I wanted next to each other. I was looking at a 240, a 440 or an M2. And I put like all the engine stuff, the interior stuff and everything you have to deal with. And the 440 came out on top for everything except for like handling on the M2 was better. Right. <coughs> but between the 340 and 440, it's pretty much the same. You know, they both come with like heads up displays and all the upgraded features inside. 
Um, the two series is the only one that's kind of like a downgrade. So sometimes I tell people, you know, you kind of got to figure out if you want more of a driver's car or more of like a comfortable car. But with the three series and four series, you get all the same stuff. So, and my four series, I mean, I bring my kids in it. I drive it everywhere. You know, I've taken it on a couple, you know, two, three hour trips. It's comfortable. It works fine. So if you want it, you want it and you'll make it work. 340 is obviously easier if you need to put people in the back seat, but I make it work with the 440. I know people are always surprised when they see me with like two car seats in the back or like both of my kids come out after I park at Cars and Coffee or something, but it's like, why not? My car was actually delivered, I think, three weeks before my son was born. So I went and picked it up by myself and my wife's like, freaking out because she doesn't know if she's going to go into labor while I'm eight hours away. So, but make it work. Let's see. Do I believe in Saratech or use it myself? Um, so I don't use it. It probably works. I'm just not somebody that chases stuff like that too much. Like, even some of these tire questions, you know, which tire is better, Michelin or Continental or, you know, Toyo or Mickey or whatever. Like, I usually just go with what works. I go with what I like. I go with what I have access to. And if it works, I'm satisfied. So I don't try to chase, like, the latest and greatest everything all the time. That's just how I operate. So with Saratech, it's like it probably works, but I haven't looked into it because what I do currently works. And I posted, like, my oil analysis video it showed that everything's fine. I have another one that I'm waiting on. I just did an oil change last week. Um, so we showed, you know, 5W40, liquid molly works. This test will show me if 5W30 is working well. And um, I'll probably just stick with 5W30. So uh, I'm sure it works, but I just, yeah, I don't try out every single new additive or oil weight or anything because I don't need to. Uh, I have kids saying there's not enough space in the back of my MT40. So the MT40 is different, right? Like I said, that's a bigger sacrifice. The 4 Series is more spacious in the back. Um, that's pretty much where all of it is because the engine bay is about the same. The uh, trunk is about the same. Like I said, I have a whole spreadsheet with like all these dimensions and stuff. Um, so I was trying to like make that decision. And that was one of the big things is that the 4 Series has more space on the inside. So it's more comfortable in the front and the back if you have people in the back. But it's still, like, manageable. My son's four. My daughter's two. Um, they both sit in car seats. They both fit fine. No issues. And when they get out of car seats, it'll probably be more comfortable. So that, that's just, like I said, for me, when I grew up, my dad had a coupe. We made it work because that's what he wanted. And I stick by the same policy, you know. If I want a coupe, I'm going to make it work. My next car is going to have two seats, so I'll have to figure out how to make it work. Um, how often should we swap spark plugs running higher boost with E? So I've actually changed my spark plugs twice in the past five years. Once was because it was kind of due. I think I had like three years, and it's like a four-year service interval, so I did it at three years. And then another time, I think I replaced it last winter or some like maybe earlier last year um, because I thought that I was having spark plug blowout or I was having like an issue with them and it ended up not fixing my problem. So the spark plugs were fine, but I replaced them thinking that that was a problem I was having. So, yeah, that's why I tell most people like three to four years should be fine depending on your setup. But just respond to your car. You know, if you are experiencing blowout or misfires, your plugs are filed out. Your gap is like super big because the tips are worn down. Then just replace them. And people looked at me crazy because I used to read my spark plugs, like especially when boot mode first came out. I was like, okay, I get it. You guys had boot mode on your, you know, 2013 335i or whatever. But this is a brand new platform, brand new tune for them. So I read my spark plugs every six months and they were always fine. I just did it as preventative maintenance after I think extra three years or something like that. So you have all the tools you need to figure that out for yourself. That's what I'm saying, basically. It's just going to depend on your specific setup. 
Uh, let's see. I have a 2018 340i with MPPSK. Is it worth it going to stage one? So I think both MHD and boot mode have admitted that their stage one 91 flash or like their AC 91 flash is pretty much the same as MPPSK. And I mean, obviously, like 91 octane is the lowest octane that our cars can handle. So that's like 95 Ron for people in Europe. Um, and their custom tune or off the shelf tune couldn't get much more power than that. So if you're going to run 93 octane or E30, then it'll give you a little bit of a bump, but it's probably going to be more for you to just get like a fuel pump and go to stage two plus. For me, stage one was a nice jump, but that's because I was like completely stock base tune. I didn't have the M performance tune. OGM2 or M2 comp? It was the OG. So that was another big reason. Like I wanted the B58 over the N55. So yeah. I mean, I knew the car was basically going to handle better and have more like street cred. That was the only thing that I was hung up on. And it looked way better. I, I do like how the M2 looks. But um, the 4 Series and M240, it was just way more advanced, way more options. You know, when I found out that the M2 and 2 Series didn't have the heads-up display, that was one of the big deal breakers for me because I really wanted that. Let's see. What's up in Lithuania? I've got people everywhere. I've actually been shipping out the brake adapters to more people internationally than in the U.S. Almost all my orders come from the U.K., so I do appreciate the support from everybody overseas and everywhere. I know the times that I post and stuff probably don't make sense for you in a lot of cases, but you guys support a lot. So I appreciate that. Let's see. If you like the F33 styling, but want a four door, just get the F36. You get a more aggressive F32 with four doors and a hatchback. So yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, you mean F32, gotcha. So if you like the 4 Series styling but want a four-door, I mean, that's the whole point of the F36. The F36 Grand Coupe is the highest-selling 4 Series. It sells more than the Coupe and convertible combined. So everybody makes fun of it for being like a four-door version of a two-door version of a four-door car, but that's what people want. That's what people buy. So that's definitely fair. Um, another big reason why I didn't consider it is because it didn't have a manual option. In the United States, you couldn't get a Grand Coupe with a six-speed, so... That wasn't even a consideration for me. But if you're getting an auto, um, it's definitely a nice looking car. Let's see, what's the max power I've seen on the stock turbo Gen 1? The most I've seen is around 520 wheel horsepower with ethanol. Uh, sorry if I'm late to this, but is an A90 in the cards at some point? You of all people could keep carrying that platform. Hey, I appreciate that, man. And it definitely was something that I considered, especially now that they're offering the manual version. I'm going to take the 340 at least for a year or two. That's not going to be here forever. I'm not going to be in love with this car, you know, but uh, that could be next, you know, if that's something that makes sense and the prices are reasonable in two years, I could jump into a six-speed A90. Um, I wouldn't jump into an auto A90. I would much rather get into like a 340 or something, but uh if I did get in an A90, that would be the kind that I would go for. One that's like maybe one or two years old CPO, hopefully with a little discount. And then do the same with it. Just try to track it. But we'll see. It depends on finances and all that good stuff because they are very expensive, even new. They're still holding their value. They're, a bunch of them are selling used for over 60 grand. It's nuts, but that's what it is. <coughs> What up, Coops? I appreciate the support, man. What size injectors do I run? I have the 750cc injectors in my port injection kit, and that's good for like a 1,000 horsepower with a Dorch Stage 2. Probably more than that. Let's see, Blackstone is right down the street from me. Oh, so you're there in Indiana, right? You must be in Indiana. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think the coolest thing about Blackstone is that they aren't actually made for us. They're made for truckers, right? Because a lot of those guys, I mean, they're literally driving thousands of miles a week. They don't have time to do oil changes all the time. So what they'll do is at a rest stop, they'll do an oil analysis, send it to them, pick it up at their next stop or whatever, or read it, you know, get it in an email. 
and see how their engine's doing because they can't do an oil change like every three days or whatever, like every time they go over 3,000 miles like some other people. So I was just reading all about that. I thought it was pretty cool. You know, it gave me a lot of confidence in that company because they're not just trying to bait enthusiasts and stuff, right? Like it's a legit business for a lot of people that really need it. Am I going to get an M? I highly doubt it. Uh, the closest I was to getting an M, like I said, I was considering an M2 before I got the 440. The new M2 will probably be another nice contender between the six-speed Supra or a six-speed M2, like an S58 M2. Um, those would probably be like the two BMWs that I would consider, but um currently i'm basically just trying to pay off all my debt and save up for something that is rear engine so not really interested in dumping a lot of money or spending a lot of money on newer cars that aren't my end goal if you know what i mean but like i said one day the 340 will be gone and i'll use the money to get into something else hopefully um that can keep me entertained All right, what is the best cooling mod for Gen 1? So the best absolute top cooling mod that you can do is a $4,000 intake manifold. So I know that's not what anybody wants to hear, but nothing beats it. The heat exchanger that I did didn't make a huge difference. And uh, I think most people that upgrade their intake manifolds, they're more concerned with strength over cooling. But that's going to be the biggest opportunity for cooling. And some of the guys with like the EOS intake manifolds and some of the bigger ones, they've actually seen IATs drop during a pull. So when you're running down the drag strip, you start seeing your IATs go up. But once you get enough airflow and get enough speed, the IATs start coming down again. That's how much cooling it provides. When you're going over like 80, 100 miles an hour and you're wide open throttle, your IATs are dropping. Just think about that. That's what an intake manifold can do. You're not going to get that from a heat exchanger or you know, any kind of additive to your coolant or anything like that. It's just four stacks. <laughs> That's why none of us do it. Let's see. It's just insane how much power I've been regularly seeing. The A90s make stock motor. Harrison Performance had a six-port car at 900 wheel horsepower. Yeah. So um, one thing just to keep in mind, I mean, we've got to, like, keep a level head with some of this stuff because a lot of the supers that we see are freaks. I mean, they're doing what's not typical and it's going to get put on blast because it's so high up there, you know, like cars running eights, <coughs> cars running eights on stock engine or running nines on stock turbo is completely insane. But the reason why everybody isn't doing it is because it's not really that common. It's kind of uncharted territory and not something that's typically recommended. So um, especially with the A90s, just because it's such a unique car, a lot of people try to baseline that and apply it to like G20s or something, and it's just not the same. So definitely no doubt, like props to the people that are doing it out there, but don't don't just assume that you can buy one and just be there with a couple of easy mods. It's, it's not always a guarantee. Yeah, so, I mean, you guys see my stories. You guys know what I'm interested in, um, but I don't have enough money to pay twice MSRP for a GT3. That's the problem right now. And the hope for most people that are paying attention to 911 prices is that the GT3 RS will come out and then the GT2 RS will come out and then GT3 prices will go down. It's definitely not a guarantee, but do you see somebody paying like 600 grand for a GT2 RS? You know, that's kind of the question because right now people are paying like 300 grand for a GT3, but that's the only option. That's like the newest, fastest option that you can get. So if they get two tiers above that, how much do you think people are actually going to pay for it? And if they find a reasonable price that puts that in a good ballpark, it should push the GT3 price down, especially the 991s. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm watching it. I'm just nowhere close yet. Mm -hmm. I'm focused on paying off my debt, so I don't have to worry about it in the future. 
But yeah, I saw like a, I think a YSOC package, um, 992 GT3 listed, not like secretly marked up. It was listed for 350 grand. I don't know what to do with that information. Just stare at it and then <laughs> keep scrolling. Let's see. Power difference between E30 and 102. That's a good question, too. So E30 should support a little bit more power. 102 is extremely high. Um, and like American octane, I think that's like, what did they say? Like 96 octane or something like that. Um, so E30, I mean, it's pretty close, but E30 should support a little more power. The only downside is you need upgraded fueling. If you just run 102, you can make more power with the same fuel setup. You just need, you know, a bigger turbo or whatever to take advantage of it. So it kind of depends on your goals and what you have available. If I had 102, I might consider just running 102, but that's probably just as hard to find as ethanol if you travel. <laughs> Do I think my air filter causes a restriction because it looks small? Um, I think I talked about this a little bit in my wastegate duty cycle video, but the problem with my car is that I'm not pushing the limits of my turbo. Uh, not really the problem, but I guess the thing about my car or what you should consider is I'm not maxing out my turbo. So what the air filter does being smaller is it um, basically increases how hard my turbo has to work to make the power it's at right now. And if I hit the limits, then the only thing I can do is upgrade my intake, increase my airflow, um, remove my intake, you know, just run like a turbo guard or something. And that will allow me to make more power. But because I'm not anywhere close to there, it doesn't really do anything. You know, maybe slightly more lag, but it's not like I could make more power if I had a bigger turbo right now because I'm limited by my clutch, not by my turbo. Um yeah, he saw a GT3 for 315. Yeah, man. I mean, it used to be a secret before. They would list them for like 200, maybe 250. And then when you called, they would tell you what the actual marked up price was. And now they're just listing it for 300 plus. So just give it a year or two and we'll see where we're at. Uh, what cars am I looking forward to in the next five to 10 years? So I'm definitely interested about the next 911 since we're already on the topic. Um, it's either going to be a hybrid or it's going to come with like a capability to run um, like synthetic fuel, which I think is really cool. Porsche is actually trying to design synthetic fuel so that we can use gas engines without having to use like 93 octane or whatever. No guarantees on how easy that will be to implement or how widely that will be adopted. But that's something that can like save internal combustion engines. You know what I mean? So... <laughs> if people can really focus on that, I think that will be really exciting and help change the narrative of just everything needing to be an electric or a hybrid. So that's probably one of the biggest ones I'm looking forward to. I hope they follow through on that because they've been talking about it for a while. Let's see. My spark plugs have 6,000 miles on them, but I gapped them because I didn't know any better. I'm running a full frame with a door stage 2 E40 map and having misfires. Um, it could be a gap issue. I doubt it if you gapped it properly. You know, it wouldn't hurt to double check your plugs, but also just look at your logs and see what's happening. You know, because just like we were talking about earlier, if you're running too much boost too soon with just a door stage 2, it can cause your fuel pressure to drop. It can handle E40. It can handle a bigger turbo. You just need to tune it appropriately. So... Um, run a log and scan for codes and see what it's actually telling you, and that'll give you a better idea of what to look for. But that, I mean, that was pretty much the same issue that I was talking about before, where I replaced my plugs and realized they weren't the problem because I was having misfires. Um, and I thought that I needed to gap my plugs for ethanol content. Then I replaced my plugs, and I basically did a bunch of testing to see if I could do anything to improve my timing or help reduce it, and none of it worked. And that's why I just tell people just keep the stop gap because none of the spark plug testing in my experience and a lot of other tuners experience has improved any of that. Oh, never mind. 
<laughs> so you're saying you you gapped your plugs and it sounded like it was canned. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, just be careful, especially if you're using like the tools that like squeeze in between the tip of the plug, like the electrode, and they kind of slide in there. You can damage the tip. So just use like really thin feeler gauges that aren't too aggressive and don't push anything in there that you don't have to. Grand Coupe is the best looking vehicle in your opinion. Yeah, I know a lot of people like it. Uh, my wife's a big fan of it. She she likes the sport back look, but now she's starting to get annoyed because of the SUVs. And I know probably some of you guys disagree with that. I hate it. I'm not a fan of it at all. Um, and I think she saw like an X6 or something and she was just like, what is happening? Because every single SUV now has like the sloping roof line to turn it into like a coupe version of an SUV. Um, but I mean, they sell, people like them. So it just kind of depends on your preference. <laughs> yeah, for kids, you need four doors. I mean, it's definitely way easier. That's why I have an X5. I have a car where I don't have to worry about it. Like I don't daily my 440. I don't have to do everything in the 440, but I know if I need to, I can. Because when the X5 was down for like three weeks waiting for my water pump to get fixed, I dailyed my 440. I drove it everywhere. When my wife was gone and I had the kids, they came with me in there. So if you want to make it work, you'll make it work. G80. No, probably not anytime soon. That's definitely, I mean, if I was looking at all of them right now, the S58 cars, the G80 is my personal favorite, but I think the M2 is going to look better and perform better when it comes out. So I wouldn't waste money on a G80 right now. And I think even with the M2, I'm probably not going to, I wouldn't seriously consider going that route. Just where my head is. But I know a lot of people will. Oh, yeah, you're in Fort Wayne. I have a couple people in Fort Wayne, too, because I used to live in Louisville, and everybody used to run up and down 65 to Indianapolis. Um, I track a lot. Like, every time I've been to the track, I was going to Putnam Park. So that was kind of like my home track, even though it was two and a half hours away. So we did a lot of stuff in Indiana. <sighs> Yeah. So for those of you that don't know, like I said, I'm going to post an oil change DIY soon. Super late, probably going to get crappy views. But I, if I don't post that on my channel, it's like missing something. Right? I should have simple DIYs like that. But I'm going to include how I take my Blackstone analysis in that DIY. And it's cheap. It's simple. It's easy to do. They send you the kit. All you do is fill up the little bottle and then drop it off at the post office and they ship it back. It comes with a return label and everything, so it's hard to beat that. And then they send you the results after, like, two weeks. The only downside is after the two weeks, if you find out something's wrong, then you realize you've been driving it with, you know, metal shavings or whatever. But, um, you know, you just do another oil change or address whatever needs to be fixed at that time. <laughs> so what are my thoughts on the new M3 and M4? So we really, we're about to kill this. I know you guys are probably looking at a lot of what they're doing is like really amazing. Um, and no doubt it's like performing really great. I just still think it's like a compromise, you know, um, everything that they're doing with the newer cars is trying to make it do more things like all in one car. And that's not really what I'm interested in. I like having a car that's specifically built for a purpose. So that's why I got the 440. I wanted a coupe. I wanted it rear-wheel drive. I wanted manual transmission. And I wanted it to feel like a sports car. And in the past, I've had, like, my Jetta and different cars that I thought I could make it do everything. And it's just not fun. It just feels like a sacrifice. And especially with the new G80, like, it looks so much better than the G82. I was kind of disappointed because I would prefer to have a coupe. So the M3 looking way better than the M4 and even the M340 looking way better than the M440 didn't sit right with me. Um, and I think BMW has been doing that for a while. Cause like the rear fenders and quarters on the M3 has looked better than the M4 for like a long time. Even on the E90, the four door looks better than the two door to me. looks more aggressive. So yeah, I just, 
I, I wouldn't like bank on that. You know, maybe if I had a way more money and I could use that as a daily, sure. And then have something else as like my fun car. But I would much rather have a coupe, manual transmission, rear wheel drive, and something that just feels like a sports car, not a fast daily. Because that's, that's how I'm looking at the M3 right now. So, you know, it kind of is what it is. Let's see. Hey, Kern, my 340 got a CL for emission EVAP. Is this a common issue? Yeah. Um, depending on the code, it might just be the little check valve on top of the intake manifold. No Clutch Garage has a video on that. But just Google the code that you got and see what comes up. It's most likely that little canister on top. If not, then you might have a leak somewhere, either like it's not plugged in properly to your intake or part of the hose is damaged and letting air out because all of that's monitored pretty closely for emissions. It has to like recirculate everything back to the intake. So it shouldn't affect performance, but for emissions, that'll cause an issue. Let's see, EOS, I'm not sure what the question is. Oh, I'm, am I way behind? I'm probably way behind on these comments. Sorry about that. Am I really a mechanical engineer? Yeah. I mean, I know I look like I just play one on TV, but I am really one as well. I actually worked in automotive for seven years as well. So I have a lot of experience there. I'll be making a video about that too. Uh, yeah, I'm way behind on these comments. Sorry, guys. Let's see. Will the B58 ever be as awesome as the N52? So I think the problem is that N is so far down from B. Like we got to go all the way up to B99 and then C01 mm -hmm. and then try to get to N52. That's going to take a really long time. By then we're going to run out of letters and numbers for our platforms. But probably when the new like R30 M390i comes out, It'll get close to the N52. I want an X3M or a 911 Turbo. Yeah. I mean, they're both good cars. My thing is the X3 is too small. Like, again, it just it feels like a sacrifice, right? If I want a big car, like a family hauler or something that I can do work in, I don't want an X3. I want an X5 or an X7. You know, so it's like the X3M looks cool, but it's like an SUV that's trying to be designed to be a track car and, you know, all these other things. And that's not what I would do with it. And my wife has been grilling me about this for like a really long time. She's like, wouldn't you want an X3M? Wouldn't you want like a Cayenne Turbo? Wouldn't you want all these different things? And it's like, if I'm looking at an SUV, I'm not worried about that. I'm just not because I'm not looking for a sports car that also has a hatchback and is lifted 12 inches in the air. <laughs> so... You know, it's definitely a cool car. It's definitely more fun than a regular X5 if you have one, but I wouldn't want that to be my car. You know, that would be like one of my cars, but I would need an actual sports car or an actual like workhorse that I didn't care about. But I'm weird. I mean, don't do not do what I do. Who would win in a race between you or Jamie? So if it was like in cars, me. If it was like eating, Jamie. Let's see, is it worth it to mix race gas and E85? So that's definitely going to help, especially if you're limited by your fuel system. So if some of these questions that we have with like a Dorch stage two, right? And I say it's limited around 700 wheel horsepower. If you use race gas, you can get up there. And the big problem right now is you're mixing E85 with pump gas, right? So you're not getting as much octane as you would with race gas. So it can help if you're at the limits of your fuel system, basically. But if you're not, then it's kind of like a waste of money. I know like the dinos that Doc Race originally posted, everybody was so surprised because they got over 600 wheel horsepower with the Dorch Stage 1. But it was because they mixed race gas with um, their pump gas and they were running meth on top. So there's like so many different ways that you can make it work. Just installed the Flowmax with the TU pump and NGK plugs. What else would I recommend? Um, Dorch Stage 2 and Tune. 
Yep, 408 B58, got it. Get the stage two, ditch the TU. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. Oh, explain not using the math sensor. So this is actually something that I'm still learning about. Um, our cars have a math sensor, but in a lot of cases, it doesn't use it. And so that's why I'm able to get away with it pretty easily on my car. Um, it does throw a code. It throws a check engine light, but the car drives fine without it. Even on other cars, like I've been able to drive it without a math sensor or a damaged math sensor. It just doesn't run as well. But on the 440, like there's no difference. And a lot of that is because of how the car calculates load and how the tuning works. It doesn't rely on the math sensor very much. And then on the later model, like TU engines, they don't even have a math sensor. It has like a temperature sensor in the intake. So I'm new to that. I'm still reading up more on it and I'll be posting a video on it when I get a good grasp of it. But basically you don't need a math sensor for the B58 to run well. And that's why more and more kits are being offered without it. Have you ever thought about getting my SCCA license? Absolutely. That's going to happen. That will happen eventually. NASA, SCCA, something. Because wheel to wheel is like the ultimate goal, right? I mean, nobody just wants to drive fast. Like, I want to beat somebody. I want to race somebody. So, yeah. At some point, when it makes sense financially and everything, I'll get there. Sorry, I'm so far behind, guys. Should I wait for the Kratos turbos or go ahead and get the Pure 850? Um, probably just get a Flow Max, honestly. Oh, here we go. I'm caught up. There we go. All right, switch back to YouTube. Let's see. I have an A90 Super that goes in the limp during watt pools. No codes. Tuned on Ecutech. My tuner can't find anything in my logs. So I think we talked about this previously because a lot of people have issues with hitting limiters and things like that. I have ran into that issue a bunch. Um, I think the problem with my car is a little different than yours since I have a manual transmission. But double check, like, uh, if you have XHP, check with that. See if you can flash stage two or stage three. See if that changes anything. Make sure you remove all your torque limiters. I think a lot of that can be done in Ecutech as well, um, or at least it'll ignore it. But... Um, you know, there's just so many different things that can cause an issue like that. But I have a hard time believing it goes in the limp mode and there are absolutely no codes. You know, if, if it's not showing on Ecutech, find like some ISTA or actual like dealership tuning software or a diagnostic software and scan with that and see what comes up. It might not show active, but it should at least show history on what codes have been thrown. And maybe that'll help. <clears throat> I'm from Akron, and I haven't been to Mid-Ohio since I was a little kid. Is it too far from Cincy? Absolutely not. I would love to go to Mid-Ohio. Um, my plan is to go to Putnam, Mid-Ohio, and um, the Corvette Museum track in Bowling Green. Those are the three that I would like to go to over the next year. So um, I think BMW CCA does a couple track days at Mid-Ohio as well. I've just never been, and I know it's kind of – a technical track and it's got like a lot of bumps and stuff like that so i would need some time to learn it but i'm pretty comfortable with putnam that's why i really want to go there and get to learn the car so i don't have to learn the track and the car at the same time um 340 is too fast how do i make it slower so the easiest way to make a 340 slower is just to take the whole b58 out and then put a vr30 in just drop it right into the engine bay and after that, you won't even be able to pass a minivan. Let's see, five cars I'd have in my dream garage. So these are only cars that, like, I love, right? Like, no compromises. Um, I'm looking for six-speed V12 Aston, Aston Martin. Um, I need a six-speed 911 GT3, probably a GT3 RS or GT2 RS converted to six-speed. Um, I'm going to have an S15 240SX. Slam, all set up for drifting. I'll probably still have my 440. And then I want to have an Aerial Atom turbo, like the K20 turbo one. Or K20 or K24, whichever one they're offered with. 
Um, is stage one worth it over stock? I think we answered that before. As long as you're running like 93 octane or E30, it'll give you a little bit of a bump, but it's more worth it to go to like stage two or stage two plus. If you only have 91 octane available, then stage one isn't worth it. Let's see. With the new Gen 1 Dino Records, have you changed your mind about the limits of the engine? No, I don't think so, because a lot of people are hitting Dino Records, and they will continue to hit Dino Records, but that doesn't change like the statistics. There are still a lot of people blowing engines in the seven to 800 horsepower range. Um, I won't say a lot of people, but relative to how many people are even there, several have. And um, it just kind of depends on a lot of things. You know, the same way that you can have two different cars off the dealer floor and one can be faster than the other. Some engines are going to be built with tighter tolerances. Some are going to be a little bit stronger. Um, and hopefully it's one of the people that are trying to push the platform. Right. So it's just kind of luck of the draw. I just think it's more important not to focus too much on the one percent. Because that's how you set yourself up for failure. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, our cars are very happy at 600 to 650. They set really good times. There are multiple people who run in low tens in the quarter mile, um, you know, and pretty much beating a lot of higher horsepower cars because our benefit is having, you know, a good transmission like the ZF8 speed and all wheel drive. If you have X drive and ZF8, it's like a cheat code. So horsepower isn't always like the primary goal, although it's always fun to make more power, right? So. I think the other thing that a lot of people aren't paying attention to is upgrading your transmission is a lot more important than upgrading your engine. And you can still run really fast on the stock engine with an upgraded trans. And I know a couple people that have built their engine with a stock trans and they say they wish they had gone the other way. So that's something to consider. I think I answered this already. Sorry. I don't know if you asked this in here before I answered it, but um, everybody that's asking about the Kratos Turbo, I don't really have a feeling on it, honestly, until they prove their numbers with like an upgraded fuel system, port injection, and all of that. I don't really think it's like a game changer. The numbers that they've shown are exactly what we've seen with any other turbo kit because they're riding the limits of the fuel system. So they need to upgrade their fueling to show the capability of the turbo, and then we'll know for sure if it's worth it. So that's what I'm waiting on. So I can dish my intake pipe and run a filter so people can actually see my turbo. Absolutely. Even with the stock turbo, you can do that. The only thing that you got to worry about are emissions codes. But the EVAP that recirculates to the intake can vent to atmosphere your crankcase ventilation hose from the valve cover can vent to atmosphere. That's pretty much what um, the PCV delete kits do or the catch cans like vent to atmosphere. That's what they do. So, you know, if you have boot mode, it's really easy with MHD. I'm finding out that it's a lot more difficult. That's why all these videos, if you guys pay attention to my Instagram, everybody's talking about my check engine lights and stuff because we're still figuring out just how many codes I'm getting with this new tune. Like I'm getting different codes I don't know if MHD is just more sensitive or whatever. Um, and in boot mode, I can do it on the tuning side. I can just type it into the configuration screen and flash the map, and it'll hide the codes. In MHD, my tuner has to do it. So it's just a little more difficult. It doesn't – it's not like the end of the world, but, you know, it's kind of up to you whether that matters, I guess. Let's see. Do I cuss? Hell no. Uh, I cuss a lot in our messages, and I wonder if <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> That's actually kind of funny because I, I don't cuss that much, honestly, I guess, but it doesn't bother me. Um, I didn't grow up like in a family that cusses or anything like that, so I kind of learned that on the streets of the suburbs of Cincinnati. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't really bother me. I'm just – that's just not my thing, I guess. So it, I don't care, though. Don't, <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, let's see. Any risk running E40 full time? Not really. I do recommend just running like one tank of 93 every once in a while. I do it twice a year. So I do it once over the summer. And then in the winter, I run 93 octane all winter. 
Um, if you drive your car regularly, it's a lot less risk, especially if you're running your tank out pretty much every time. So, yeah, I mean, the biggest risk is that you're going to have some ethanol sitting at the bottom of the tank for like an extended period of time. And you don't really want to do that. And it's just like your oil, right? You're never going to use up all the fuel in your fuel tank. So that's why running a tank of 93 can help dilute it and make sure that even if you have old ethanol at the bottom of the tank, you can flush it out. Do I need a Dort Stage 1 or TU pump to run a big boost MPR 1200? Oh, you are going backwards, my boy. Dort Stage 1 or TU. You're going to be leaving a lot on the table. That's all I'm going to say. Definitely at least get a Dort Stage 2 if you want to push it or get a cheaper, simpler turbo system. Just think about your goals, right? Because you've got a turbo kit that can support, you know, a 1,000 horsepower and a fuel pump that can support 600 maxed out. So what, what are you actually trying to do with your car? The turbo kit like that by scraping by on an entry level. Oh, yeah. So you're saying the same thing I am. And keep in mind, again, I think I talked about it in a video already, but a Dorch Stage 1 and a TU pump flow almost the same. So a Dorch Stage 1 came on, like, the LT1 cars, like the base Corvette Stingrays and, um, you know, Camaro SS and stuff. Those cars are, like, 400 and some horsepower. <clears throat> so it's not designed to support a lot of power. The LT4 ones, like the Dorch Stage 2 and FX180, those came on the um, ZL1... ZR1, Z06, um, you know, all the cars that make like 640 or 650 plus horsepower. So that's why it can support so much more fuel. Um, I found metal in my oil filter, but it was not magnetic. I believe it was oil pan. What else can it be? Uh, it's kind of hard to say. Um, there aren't there aren't that many um, metals that aren't magnetic. I don't know. It, it would be really hard to say. I think the main thing to consider is if you're actually having any issues because you're always going to have some engine wear. Um, if it's like a chunk of something, I would be worried. But if it's like a little bit of glitter, that's usually something that just you want to keep an eye on. Also, of course, this is a good reason why you want to send out your oil for analysis so that they can tell you exactly what kind of metal it is. But, yeah, it, it's kind of hard to say. There aren't a lot of metals used in our engine either. So a lot of the internals are pretty much one of, like, three materials. I'm only looking to run 600 horsepower right now. My stock turbo died and looking to replace it. Yeah, so, again, I mean, think about your end goal. Like I'm, I'm right there with you, right? I had my Dock Race Turbo Kit with a TU pump, but that's because I like testing stuff and I'm annoying. If you're not like me and you don't like changing stuff over and over, then figure out what like your actual end goal is. If you only want to run 600 horsepower and you're not planning on pushing it much farther, I would probably recommend just getting a hybrid. It'll be much better use. Even like if you're getting a big boost kit, there are lower powered ones that will spool faster and be less of a sacrifice than getting an NPR 1200 kit, unless you're literally just like buying it used from somebody and getting like a ridiculous deal. I know some people do that too, and they're just, you know, deal with it being a little laggy and stuff. What's up, Slurpee Cup? What's good, gangster? Let's see where we're at on Instagram. I already have evap delete on my big boost kit. Yeah, so you just got to delete the codes with your tuner. It's simple enough. It's just emission stuff, so it doesn't really affect power. Assuming you don't care about emissions or safety inspections, how many of the lines that run over the intake manifold can be deleted? Pretty much all of them. I am very close to deleting all of them. Um, I know Bimmer Network is working on an additional plug to help us delete pretty much that whole canister that's on top of the manifold can be unplugged underneath the car, and you can just let it vent to atmosphere. Um, so you can remove all of those hoses. I do have some of the wires that go over the intake manifold tucked underneath as well. I did that when I did my port injection install to help clean it up. I just didn't really talk about it, I guess. Um, but I mean, I've done wire tucks in the past and stuff, so I am a big fan of cleaning up your engine bay. 
I know some people think it's a waste of time, but especially with our engine, it's just such a mess. Even with like the people that have upgraded valve covers and stuff, it just looks crazy because there's so many wires and hoses. Mm -hmm. So. Appreciate the support. I don't know if I have the best channel, man. I will say I'm still I'm still growing and learning because YouTube really sucks. I'm, I'm going to be completely honest. It sucks. If you have a life and like responsibilities, it sucks. This is the kind of thing that you want to jump into when, you know, you're younger, you don't have kids, you're not married and like you have time to commit to this. It is extremely hard to find the time to keep up with making these videos. And even lately, like I've been pretty much day by day trying to upload and edit videos at the same time. If you guys see a video, I probably edited it in the last like 24 hours. And I used to be like way farther ahead. I tried to get ahead this past week because I was off work and I still haven't had time to do anything. It just, it really sucks. <laughs> it's not like actually physically hard or anything. Obviously like technically it's not that bad, but just finding time to do it and being able to commit that much time to YouTube and social media and all that stuff. It, it sucks. So, but I, I do appreciate the support. I just know there's a, definitely a lot of growth that the channel could use. You know, I'm trying to change up the style a little bit. Hopefully you guys notice that with the B58 digest and stuff. I just, I, I want to make it like as educational and helpful as possible. So I'll try to take advantage of every idea I have. Let's see, is it better to log using the paddle shifters? Yeah. Definitely. And I mean, the main thing about logging is you usually have a specific requirement for what you're trying to log. So you want to start and end at a specific RPM. You probably want to start in a specific gear. So that means you don't want to use the kick down. You don't want the car automatically downshifting or shifting for you, especially if you have a big turbo car and you're doing a custom tune. Um, the trans might prevent you from shifting when you want to shift. So Keep it in manual mode, shift it redline, you know, do whatever your tuner recommends ultimately. But yeah, that, that's your best bet is do it in a manual mode. Usually when people are racing, though, a lot of people I know, they say they have better performance in sport mode. So keep that in mind, too. I know some people launch in manual mode and then once they get out of the hole or they get their first shift off, then they switch over to sport and just let the car carry them. Excuses. You don't want me to respite excuses right now. Good, sir. <laughs> oh, Meg, you're preaching to the choir. Because everybody on YouTube is like, oh, man, your video quality is low. Like, if you guys go look at my live stream quality, it looks like it's being filmed on a sidekick. Everybody that's on YouTube, you guys see it right now. And trust me, I know. This is like a $200 laptop from Walmart. And I had my gaming laptop that was like all specced out. I had it built how I wanted to and it broke. And I told myself, okay, I'm going to buy this laptop. And over the next year or two, you know, I'm going to build another one and replace it. And that was in 2016. <laughs> so I was like, I just don't have time for anything. I don't have money to really devote to that because I'm putting most of my money in my car and my family and stuff. So. You know, it's just a sacrifice. I mean, you got to prioritize, right? This is real life. So it is what it is. But YouTube has given me some really big opportunities. So I'm trying to prioritize it as much as possible. It's just not the top priority. So it sucks trying to squeeze it in with other, you know, more important things. But yeah, I'm glad you understand because it's just, it's YouTube, right? And Instagram, like it's not that big a deal. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to take advantage of it as much as I can. You have seven kids. Oh, wow. Yeah, you need like an X10, bro. Seven kids. That hits a different. I think BMW is going to come out with like an Econo line in a couple of years. Look out for that. What type of oil pressure is normal? Actually, that's one thing that I haven't paid a whole lot of attention to. Like most cars, it's between like 40 and 80 PSI. Um, depending on RPM. So, and it'll go up as RPM goes up because the oil pump will be spinning faster. But our cars are really sensitive. It'll throw a fault if you go below like 
the recommended oil pressure. Oh, okay. So yeah, I mean, I guess uh, word is getting out. I don't know like how much is out there, but I'm seeing more and more people comment on this. So I guess it's okay for me to comment on it now. Um, but Pure has been working on a cast option. So I think we bought it already because it does not need a core anymore. So I've been looking out, waiting for them to make an official announcement. Maybe I missed it, um, but I was waiting on that official announcement to actually make the B58 Digest video to cover it. Um, but they have been talking about that for a little while because just like everybody else, they've been facing supply chain issues. They couldn't get enough stock turbos and everybody was complaining about delay, delay, delay. So during that time, they worked on making their own cast manifold or sourcing their own cast manifolds. So that's good news for people that are looking for pure 800s. The wait time will be reduced. Um, hopefully the price will come down or at least there won't be that option for like a core charge anymore. Um so we'll see. But yeah, that's really big news, I think, because they haven't done that ever, as far as I'm aware. But yeah, I mean, it should be pretty much the same turbo. It'll just be a cast manifold instead of a modified OEM manifold. So same recommendation as the current one. And yeah, 600 horsepower with the TU pump is going to be about the limit, and that'll require ethanol. Let's see, I'm fine with the lag. 600 isn't my end goal. It's just my short time goal. Yeah, that's cool too then. I mean, like I said, that's why I bought my turbo kit. I bought a smaller turbo with it. Um, even with the NPR 1200 kit, I think it's mostly the same as like their stage four kit that comes with a slightly smaller NPR. It'll spool a little faster and just have less top end power capacity. Um, so you can run that until you're ready to upgrade to the 1200 kit or, you know, there's just a lot of different options there. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to make sure it sounded like you were just buying the NPR 1200 because it was one of the highest rated ones and then pairing it with a TU pump. You're, you're leaving a lot of you're leaving a lot of room on the table. Not sure if you've seen the question, but would you bring the 440 to a roll event? Absolutely. I'm trying to my goal is to participate in streetcar takeover this year because they're coming to Cincinnati. Um, it depends on how much it costs because I think it's actually pretty expensive. But, um, you know, we'll see. Since it's local to me, I figured why not? That would be fun. In your opinion, is running MHD backend flash and maps from JB4 the same as running MHD maps? It should be pretty much the same, but I just I struggle with JB4, man. I know a lot of people that have the JB4 doing some unexpected things, interacting with the tune, even when it's supposed to be like turned off or in the zero setting or whatever. So um, it's supposed to just basically be an MHD map with the JB4 features on top, but I don't, I don't think it's really worth it. It's a lot more money for not a lot of improvement. I got a 2021 M240i with a TU pump, downpipe, CSF heat exchanger, only have the JB4 and 17 PSI is the limit on 93 and 21 on E30. Looking to get a flash to optimize those numbers. Honestly, it'll probably be similar, but keep in mind the power will be smoother. You'll be able to run like better data logging and diagnostic capabilities. So if something goes wrong, it'll be easier to figure it out. Um, there are more options. You won't have to run a TU pump. You can run a Dorch Stage 2. You can run, um, you know, different burbles and just a lot of different settings in a flash tune to optimize that compared to a JB4. But make sure that your car is unlocked, that your DME is unlocked. If you have a locked DME, then you'll have to wait either way. Uh, B58 sounds so silent in videos in real life. They seem louder. I don't think so, honestly. Um, even like this guy saw my turbo kit, and, you know, he saw my car and he asked me to rev it. And he was like, oh, it's a sleeper. <laughs> and I told him, I was like, I've literally got almost a straight pipe. I've got a catless down pipe, a muffler delete. All I have are the resonators in the middle. And people are like, oh, it's a sleeper. It's not that loud, especially when I'm cruising around and stuff. When I floor it, it opens up. But the car naturally is pretty quiet, and that's why you can go kind of crazy with the exhaust and not be a complete, you know, asshole until it ends up being a straight pipe. That's when it's pretty bad. 
Let's see, it's the Bosch branded TU pump. Okay to install. Yeah, it's the same pump. They're all the same. Uh, what do I think about getting a pure 850 over an 800? I, I don't think it's that big a deal. Whatever's available is what I would go with. An 850 isn't going to be a significant improvement unless you're literally maxing out your pure 800 and almost nobody does. So I know most people were getting the pure 850s because the 800s were back ordered. That of course makes sense, but I'm not like losing my mind to make sure I get an 850 over an 800. Let's see. The question was, how do you prevent kick down? So there's actually a button underneath your pedal. And when you push the throttle all the way down, you'll hear it like click or feel it click. And that's the kick down. So you basically want to push your foot flat to the floor, but not click that button. That's what the kick, the kick down switch is. Can you help me read a log? Yep. Uh, for everybody on here, you guys can send me a log on instagram or my facebook page my facebook page is linked on all my youtube videos and you can send me a message i don't always get back to you guys really quickly sorry about that but i definitely will get to it when i can so i'll read logs help you figure out codes and all that good stuff <coughs> what's the worst that would happen if my ventilation hose gets worked so if you have the crankcase ventilation hose code Again, it's not the end of the world, but make sure that there isn't a leak at the intake. That would be a problem. Do you think there will ever be an option just to buy a top mount manifold? Uh, I thought there was one. I think like Full Race offers one. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I know two people now that have made manifolds available separately. Sorry about that. Um, I know two people now that have made manifolds and sold them, and then they got copied within like six months. So that's why most people don't do it. Another company will take it and copy it, and then you lose money. Let's see, I love my Pure 800. It's been reliable. I ran it off the shelf mat for a bit until I found out until I found a tuner for a custom tune. Any issues running it off the shelf map on a hybrid? Nope. I ran it off the shelf map on my car. I made a video about it, posted logs, um, posted my times. I floored it. I beat on it. I drove it on back roads, everything, raced it with it. It was fine. I did the same thing. I ran it off the shelf map until my custom tune was ready. If you ever have a custom tune that doesn't perform that well, has an issue, misfires, whatever, you can switch to an off-the-shelf map and run that in the meantime. You know, there, there are a lot of different options there. Just make sure you run logs, read them, make sure it's safe. Um, you know, if you're like up in Colorado, up in the mountains or something, it might perform differently. But for me, uh, mm -hmm. relatively close to sea level-ish, it wasn't that bad. Let's see, I need to know your real thoughts on that guy arguing with Dre on IG, coming with the TU pump. So I've actually heard this a lot, right? Like there are a lot of people that are extremely confused about Gen 1 versus Gen 2 engines. And it's not a problem to be misinformed or ignorant or whatever. But when people are like, I really literally have one right here, it just blows my mind because I don't know how that could even aspire to happen. But that's pretty much what he was saying, right? I don't know if you guys saw it, but on um, one stock F30 on Dre's Instagram post, this guy was basically saying he had a Canadian spec 440 that had a TU engine in it. So he thought that cars after 2018 came with the TU engine. And I mean, first of all, it's impossible. They never were offered with the TU engine. They never put it in an F30, F32, anything like that. And his thoughts were that Canadian spec cars are maybe spec a little bit higher. So that's why they got TU engines in their four series and we didn't. And again, that's not possible. It's not true. So um, I don't know what the situation was. Like some people will tell me they have a TU pump on their car and then send me a picture of it. And that's a stock pump. Um, or some people will tell me they have a TU engine because they see the TU pump. But I mean, from the valve cover and everything else, you know, it's a Gen 1 B58. So 
some folks just don't know what to look for. It's hard to say what his specific situation was, but yeah, I mean, he was just extremely confused and I don't know anything beyond that. I didn't PM him or we didn't have any conversations outside of what you saw. The only thing I was really focused on is the main comment is one of my friends. Like it's a guy that I ride with in Cincinnati. <laughs> so I just was like, man, you could have just came to me. Obviously I could tell you the difference between a 16 and 17. Um, or what was it? He was asking between a 17 and 18 what the difference was. But uh, yeah, that, that comment just didn't make sense. And it's, it's going to continue happening. BMW kind of made it confusing too, because the four series and three series, like every generation or body style has different cutoffs because the G series got it earlier than the F series. And then all the F series didn't switch over at the same time. Like somebody just posted, they have a 2021 M240i. That has a Gen 1 B58. Like, that is confusing. A 2020 M340 has a Gen 2, but a 2021 M240 has a Gen 1. And it's just because the cutoffs for the 3 Series and the 4 Series and the 2 Series are all, like, staggered and different. So it, it's going to continue to be confusing. I'll probably make a video trying to help explain it, but it's not going to help. No, nobody's ever going to fix that problem. How do I like running the B58 OC page? That sucks as well. Anybody that's paying attention to B58 OC knows that the page is not doing great. Um, you know, I'm getting a lot of followers. I'm getting a lot of likes and stuff and shares overall. But the individual post likes have dropped off like really significantly. And I don't know why a lot of my latest posts have only gotten like 25 likes. So I, I don't know why some people are saying they're not seeing my posts. Some people are telling me that because I made it like a professional profile or community page um, that Instagram is trying to bait me into paying for like ads and stuff to boost the post because it shows that I'm like trying to make a page that will grow fast and not just a personal page. And that's not going to happen. I'm not paying them money. So um, I think I mentioned that at the beginning. Instagram will be Instagram. It is what it is. Hopefully we'll just continue growing and getting followers despite the algorithm fighting me. <laughs> Let's see, and what's my favorite Gen 1 car? 440 is my favorite. I just like the style. I like how it looks. I like how it feels and drives. It's extremely planted, um, especially, I mean, I did suspension wheels and tires before I even did my tune. So I was on a stock tune. The car looked pretty much the exact same. I've had these wheels for four years. I've had my suspension for four years. Um, so, you know, I, I really enjoyed just the feel and the handling of the car. And I think a 240 might have been a little bit more tossable, but I, I'm a, more of a fan of like downforce and grip and stability more than kind of like nimble, kind of light feeling cars. That's just my personal preference. Are there any F32 LS swaps? Uh, not that I know of, but I do know there is somebody swapping a rotary in what I believe is a four series. It's kind of like a weird chop up, like it looks like an M3, but they put like a wide body kit on it. So it's hard to tell what it started out as. And I know some people buy like aftermarket body kits and stuff to make cars look different. So um, it's either a four series or like an M4 and they have like a three rotor in it. That's pretty cool. I think I've shared a couple posts on my Instagram story showing it. <laughs> you said 600 horsepower with TU pump is the limit for but for TU pump, it says the limit is 600 wheel horsepower. Sorry, I use them interchangeably. Um, a lot of people don't really like specify which one. So um, 600 wheel horsepower, like on a dyno jet, that's about the limit of a TU pump. Yeah. Sorry for not saying that correctly. Do I think injector failures are an issue that's blown out of proportion? Yeah, I think so. And I mean, not so much it's blown out of proportion that... You know, it's not a serious problem. I mean, if you have an injector issue, it can take out your engine if you keep driving it. So that's a big deal. But I don't think it's as common as people claim, you know. Um, I mean, it's just kind of one of those things that can happen. I had an injector failure on my GLI. You know, I mean, it's a common issue. If you go to M3 forums, I forget what I was. Oh, I was searching for low pressure fuel pump information. And I found somebody asking if a low pressure fuel pump upgrade would prevent their injectors from failing on their B58. 
in their forum posts all over like N55 forums and N54 forums about injector failures. Like it's just something that can happen. It's not limited to the B58. It's not limited to BMW. So what's important is making sure you pay attention to your car. Um, if you're getting misfires or having issues, park it, you know, run logs regularly to make sure everything's working well and you should have good luck. You know, it's, it's a freak accident that can happen. You can't always prevent it from happening, but there are a lot of things that you can do to reduce your chances. Is TU pump safe with all those injector failures? So the TU pump isn't going to cause injector failures. There are people having injector failures on completely stock cars, no tune, no anything. So it's not caused by a tune. It's not caused by a pump. It's not caused by ethanol or like one specific thing. Like there are a lot of different things that can cause it. And it's really just up to you to figure out, you know, when it needs to be addressed. Let's see which group on what platform uh, you're responding to something I said. I don't know what I said that made you ask that. Which group, what platform? If you're talking about the Instagram page, B58 Owners Club or B58OC, I made that page back in like the end of December. So it's been out for about six or seven months. Um, and we're just sharing everybody's cars, sharing posts about new products and things like that. I'm just making that kind of like a general B58 page. So this current 417 page is like my personal Instagram. Um, and then that'll be a page where I can help people share their cars, share posts. If you've got something for sale, I can share it to my stories. If you've got a business you want to advertise, I can share it. I don't charge. I don't do any of that. Yeah. If you tag me in a post, I'll add you to the queue and, set and uh, post it. If you keep asking me, when am I going to share your post? It's not going to help it happen any faster. Usually that makes your messages go to the bottom of my DMs because it's sequenced by, you know, when you sent your last message. So I know that annoys a lot of people. They're like, oh, I tagged him in a post and I sent him all these messages and he's not responding and he's not posting me. But I've got like 11 cars backed up right now waiting to be posted. And I only post like two or three times a day. So sorry, it's going to take a while. And that's why I haven't been able to repost people that have already been posted because there are a bunch of folks that are waiting for their first post to come on page and I'm trying to do that first. So. It's not a lot of fun to manage, but it's definitely helpful for the community, I think. Did I come up with a personal plate? I really like 340 by. <laughs> Somebody recommended that and I really like that one. So we'll see once it's actually roadworthy and ready to get a plate if I stick with it. But um, that's kind of what I'm leaning on right now. <laughs> I lowered my car on H&R Super Sport Springs and got in alignment with the car. Pulls really hard to the right at higher speeds. So I have had that issue before. Um, first of all, double check your alignment. Make sure that your camber and everything is square. If you have more camber on one side or more toe on one side, that can cause that issue. Um, the other thing is that our cars have an electronic steering um, like sensor that will try to straighten the car if it's not aligned properly. So it's really important to square up your steering with your steering wheel and not the other way around, if that makes sense. Because um, like basically what happened to me, I do my own alignments at home. And when I had it squared up, it was a little bit to the left. So I was able to drive on the car or drive the car straight with the steering wheel straight, but the steering sensor was reading at an angle. And I basically had to recalibrate my sensor so that it knew what the new straight was. Um, so yeah, I mean, if that sensor reads that you're pulling like six degrees to the left or whatever, it will try to straighten out the wheel. It's not even the tires pulling you, it's the wheel trying to straighten itself because it thinks that it's turned. So that can also be an issue and that can be corrected with um, ISTA. Do I want races to post? Yeah, definitely. Um, I post races on B58OC, but the problem is, like I said, I've got so many people tagging me every day waiting for their first, first post to be shared. If I've already posted you and then you tag me in another post with a race or something else, like new mods, people are like, oh, can you post my new wheels? Can you post this and that? Um, it's struggle for me because, like I said, I've got like 10 people waiting that haven't been posted yet. And I try to post everybody once before I post somebody like a second or third time. 
So that's why it's hard. And I just don't post enough every day. I feel like if I post more, my engagement will drop because all of my posts are fighting with each other to make it on your feed. So I think that's another reason why my engagement is down a little bit because I used to post once a day. Then I started posting twice a day. Now I'm posting up to three times a day trying to help get enough posts out. So I'm not like backlogged so much. But, you know, it's okay. I mean, everybody, I think, is enjoying it. I'm probably being more critical of myself than you guys are. Just trying to make sure it works the best for everybody. <clears throat> what do I need to get 500 horsepower and be reliable? Uh, you need to get a B58 and you need to get an ethanol tin with an upgraded fuel pump. Easy peasy. Uh, what are my favorite mods? My absolute favorite mod that nobody cares about are my taillights because I have the European black line tails. And that's what makes the housing a little bit darker. And then it also flashes amber with my turn signals. The American taillights flash red. And people don't notice it. People don't care when I explain it to them. But that is literally like my favorite mod. That's something that I was looking for for years before I got it because I couldn't figure out if there were any options. I wanted to tint my lights, but I knew that wouldn't give me the look that I wanted. And when I found out about the black lines, it was perfect. So I, I really love that. It ties the rear end in perfectly. Oh, we've been on here for a while. We might be wrapping up soon. Thanks again to everybody that joined and everything. Um, I'll try to answer a couple more questions. How many miles are on my four series? It has 24,000 miles. So pretty low miles, I know. You might need camber plates if camber is the issue. It was aligned by an alignment specialist and still didn't change at all. Yeah, so just look at your actual um, alignment sheet. They should have given you a printout so that you can tell what's wrong. The thing about it is you can't adjust camber. And that's what he's saying. Like you might need camber plates or um, knuckles to fix the camber, especially if you have like a bent control arm or something like that. BMW doesn't have adjustable or adjustable camber on the front of our cars. So the only way that they adjust it is they offer different knuckles that help change your camber. But yeah, even like just saying that you can check like your control arms and stuff, make sure nothing's bent, make sure everything is straight and connected properly because that can cause issues too. Yeah, man, appreciate the support. So my kids are napping. It sounds like they're actually waking up now, but that's why I can hang out on here for a while. So hopefully we should be putting out more videos this week. Um, like I said, I'm going to make a video on the Performance Fueling Solutions Low Pressure Fuel Pump. I think that's a really big one because I didn't realize how different it was from the others that are offered already. Um, so I want to share that information with you guys. And then I'm going to make a general low pressure fuel pump upgrade video for everybody that's wondering why we never talk about low pressure fuel pump upgrades and what the difference is um, or when it's needed, because that is something that, you know, hopefully people aren't buying when they don't need it. It's actually something that most of us don't need, but uh, it's nice to have an upgrade from PFS that will be nice plug and play, easy to run and have a lot more capacity over stock. So I'm excited to talk about that too. Um, but yeah, I think we're going to wrap this up. Thanks again to everybody that joined. Um, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to DM me or, you know, whatever. You can leave a comment on the channel and I try to respond if you leave a comment on a video or whatever. And uh, yeah, so that's it for today. Appreciate it, guys. We'll talk later. Bye.